Necromancer Academy's Genius Summoner. Chapter 46 The hostess, who had been grabbed by Simon, gradually narrowed her eyes. Damn it! Be careful! Pierre's seemingly nervous voice echoed in his head. Simon focused all his attention on the hostess' legs exposed through the dress because of the dagger on the band tied to her thigh. But in the end, her hand didn't head towards the dagger. She closed her eyes and opened her mouth. I'm sorry, but could you please release my arm? Simon belatedly realized that he had put too much force on his hand holding her wrist. As Simon let her go, the hostess sat back down and combed back her disheveled hair. Very well. She nodded. If you want the truth that badly, there's nothing we can do about it. However, you'll have to bear all the risks that come with the information. Are you okay with that? Yes. Of course. Then please wait here for a moment. The hostess got up and walked to another room. The warlike atmosphere eased up, and Simon let out a small sigh. Pierre, it was just a hunch, but it looks like there's actually something here. If we're lucky, we might be able to find out the whereabouts of Eliza B. You e. Pierce sitting next to Simon heaved his shoulders with laughter. Ha 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 ha. Simon frowned and covered his ears. Of course, that didn't really make the voice ringing in his head any weaker, though. W. H. Watts so suddenly wrong? I was dubious about it, but now I'm certain. Stay alert, boy. Pierce's eyes gleamed inside the helm. That woman is Elizabeth. What? The moment Simon uttered a surprised voice without knowing, a change began to take place inside the Thieves' Guild. The bodies of people sitting, drinking, or playing poker swelled up with cracking noises. Kwa! You're really a bold one, boy. To threaten an ancient undead right in front of you. If I hadn't emitted bloodthirst from your side, your neck would have been blown away already. Zizip! Rip! The skins of the people were torn, and spiders with dozens of eyes popped out from within them. Simon stepped back in terror. SHHHHHHHK. SHHK. SHHHHHHHHHHHKL. A type of undead known as a corpse spider. They were Elizabeth's kin. Simon and Pierre were surrounded by spiders in an instant. That was a great force, kid of Kizen. The footsteps of the hostess rang out as she re-entered. Then, she crossed her legs after getting on the table with a voluptuous figure. As she dropped her forehead down with the tip of her index finger, the flesh flowed down like a garment, revealing her foreign crimson eyes. Kill everyone. Her voice turned dark. Using it as a signal, the corpse spiders began to jump in from all sides. Boy! Shouted Pierre. Simon quickly activated the subspace equipped on his finger and called out Pierre's greatsword. Lightly grasping that heavy weapon with both hands, Pierre stepped forward with his right foot and made a wide sideways swing with it. Bwah away a wash. A huge line split the air, and the bodies of the corpse spiders that entered the gap were split in half. Green blood splattered into the air, wetting the floor and ceiling. Elizabeth! Pierre's loud cry resounded as though it would destroy the basement. Oh my, so it was you after all, Pierre. Elizabeth crossed the other leg and smiled. What kind of wicked plan are you plotting in a village like this? The Legion has revived. Stop this nonsense and come back immediately. She smiled with her eyes and stretched out her arm. I refuse. The ceiling was destroyed with a loud noise, and the corpse spiders dangling on spider webs attacked them. Simon quickly noticed it and ducked down, and Pierre swung his greatsword to slash them. Blood and entrails splattered across floor. Pierre, you're stupid. Richard used us to his liking and kicked us to the curb. Do you still have lingering attachments for the Legion even after that shuddering experience? You idiot! shouted Pierre after piercing through the body of a rushing spider with his greatsword. Did your mind rot while living along with humans? Legion is strength and will blabbering things like kicking us to the curb or a shuddering experience. How could a captain of the Legion be swayed by such trivial emotions? How could I not? There was a great hatred in her crimson eyes. I hate Richard to the point of death with how he pushed his comrades that shared sorrows and joys for decades to a deadly place just because of a woman. The undead spiders rushed in endlessly. 
In fact, this basement was full of corpse spiders. Anne. Her gaze turned to Simon. Pierre, I pity you too. A first-year boy in Kizen, just like when you and Richard met. So you wheel the kiddo who'll behave well instead of him too. Way a hap. In an instant, the white greatsword ripped through the air and flew in front of Elizabeth. She urgently grabbed the greatsword with both her hands. Poo! The shockwave alone blew away objects and shattered glass. That's it. You're being too arrogant now. Pierce stretched out his hand. The handle of the greatsword flickered with jet black and returned to Pierce's hand at a tremendous speed. Seeing that, Simon's eyes lit up. The attraction of a skeleton. Peer twisted his waist like a combination lock and swung his greatsword. The slash shot out like a tsunami and once again struck Elizabeth's body. Wham! She frowned and received the slash with both arms. Have you already forgotten the time you crawled like a dog under me? How dare you try to walk over a marshal of the Legion? At that moment, jet black as red as blood gathered on Elizabeth's fingernails. The slash pushing Elizabeth to the end of the wall cracked with a loud noise, and then shattered like pieces of glass. And you've weakened a lot, Pierre. It seems like it hasn't been long since your seal has been released. She stepped on the crumbled debris and climbed to the ground. Are you running away? With his great sword raised, Pierre tried to chase her, but the corpse spiders blocked his way. Pierre's face contorted. You small fries. See you next time, Pierre. Anne. Waving from above, Elizabeth's gaze focused on Simon. Boy of Kizen. After leaving those words, she disappeared along with a spider waiting above. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. So that's how it is. The only Thebes Guild remaining in this territory was actually Elizabeth and her group. Controlling and modifying information would have been a piece of cake. No wonder why the Lord couldn't solve the case, no matter how much time and money he invested. S-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
Yeah, I'll be careful. Just like Simon, she seemed to be chasing Elizabeth. Then that meant the Lord of Arnish had commissioned this mission to both Kizan and Ethnal. Double request. I'll have to quibble about that next time. By the way, the scale was becoming too large for a blue request form. An ancient undead opposing the Legion, and even a student from Ethnal. Simon started to wonder what the best way was to untangle this twisted thread. Peer. What is it? Tell me more about Elizabeth, please. What I told you while on the way here was everything. No. Not about her abilities or physical strength, but more personal things. Simon gulped. What happened between my father and Elizabeth? Peer let out a feigned laugh. Kuhihi. What happened my ass? Damn it. What? Fine, I'll tell you. Elizabeth loved Richard. Simon's jaw dropped. An undead to a human. An entity belonging to the Legion ended up having feelings toward the commander. Pierre had a displeased look while saying that. She was unusual from the beginning when she joined the Legion. She was emotional, unlike an undead, and she was often swayed too much by those emotions. Pierre lined up the stories related to Elizabeth. Elizabeth's love, her obsession with Richard, and even her jealousy toward Anna. Simon closed his eyes and pondered. We're here, boy. The place that Pierre dropped Simon off was somewhere in the forest near the Arnish territory. Simon looked around him, looking at the dense coniferous forest. But there's nothing here. Step back. Pierre swung his greatsword and cut through the air. Then, the space split apart as though it was torn, and an old ruined castle surrounded by cobwebs was revealed. Kuhi! This is their main base. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Let's head in. Simon and Pierre opened the door and entered the abandoned castle. Ah! And as soon as they entered, a quite explicit scene was laid out in front of their eyes. Chapter 47 at the entrance of the abandoned castle, a dozen people who seemed to be on the verge of being eaten by spiders were caught in a spider's web and hung like cocoons. Looks like these were the people who had disappeared from the territory. A corpse was also found on the floor, and it was the same kind of desiccated corpse as the ones found at the scenes of the incidents. It seemed inevitable that Elizabeth was, as expected, behind the missing cases. Person. It's a person. Some people in the territory found Simon at that moment. H help me. Please let me out of this. The spider monsters are trying to eat us. Large amounts of clamor broke loose. Simon nodded calmly, pulled out his sword from the subspace, and cut the cobwebs. Please help too, Pierre. Heh. What a bunch of useless bastards. As Pierre clicked his tongue and swung his greatsword, the five people hanging from the spider's web fell. Because they fell while hanging upside down, groans could be heard from everywhere. Simon said while making a wry smile. Pierre, be gentle. I don't want to waste my time on such pathetic bastards. Still, Pierre swung his sword once more and dropped the people to the floor. After using his short sword to cut the spider's web binding a person, Simon handed the sword to them. Please release the rest of them with this. We'll go hunt those spider monsters. Th thank you so much. We'll never forget what you have done for us. While they freed each other from the webs, Simon and Pierre started moving back into the abandoned castle. Boy! Aren't you too merciful towards captives for a necromancer? Simon asked, tilting his head. Then what should a necromancer do? Obviously, you should kill them every time you see them. Raise them up as a skeleton to use as your power. I told you that, in Kizan, killing people to turn them into undead is prohibited. This place is the site of an accident, and there'll be no witnesses. So what's wrong with it? Aren't you the type of person who's not bound by such notions? Simon scratched the side of his head and smiled bitterly. The truth is, there's a saying that my father always told me, you see. What is it? Do not turn into a monster. Pierce shut his mouth after getting startled by those words and he said that it's very important to set a line to not become a monster. The corners of Pierre's lips rose up terribly. An advice that can be given because it's Richard, huh? What? Kuhihi. No, it's nothing. 
If that's your will, I, as the Marshal of the Legion, will gladly respect it. The two passed through the hallway and entered the spacious area of the old castle. The windows were a destroyed mess, and the moonlight shone through them. It was a place full of dust and cobwebs. And you could see Elizabeth sitting on a large chair and drinking tea in the distance. Kuhi! Did you give up on running away? Pierce spoke while raising his sword. She took a light sip of her tea and smiled with her eyes. Not really, Pierre. Since you have sensed my jet black, you would chase me to the ends of the continent no matter where I run, right? You know it very well. Then I just thought I'd have to get rid of you here. She snapped her fingers. Spiders rushed in through the ceiling and broken windows. Simon and Pierre quickly stood back to back. And now that you've released my toys, I think I'll need a new one. She licked her lips and looked at Simon. I think it'll be a pleasant entertainment if I tease that kid of kissing you're taking care of in front of you, don't you think? The moment Pierre frowned and was about to open his mouth, Simon reached out and stopped him. It's fine, Pierre. Boy. I'm the commander of the Legion. I'll try to talk to her from now on. Simon strode forward. The spiders made screeching sounds and prepared to jump at any moment, but Simon didn't mind them. Captain of the former Legion, Elizabeth. She looked at Simon with curious eyes. I'm making a formal proposal. Please join my Legion. Ha! She let out a small laugh. Didn't you hear what I was talking about with Pier? I have no intention of rejoining the Legion that had already abandoned me once. Furthermore, the tip of her index finger pointed at Simon. You're telling me to work under a necromancer who has no fundamentals like you, and was just chosen by Pierre getting nostalgic of his past. I hate such vulgar jokes. PFT. Bwah. Suddenly, Pierre's loud laughter broke loose from behind. Elizabeth's expression stiffened up terribly. What's so funny, Pierre? He he. I chose him because he resembled Richard. How ridiculous. You don't know anything about him. A question mark appeared on her face. I guess there's no need to hide it anymore. Simon put his hand on his chest and continued. I'm the son of Richard Polantia and Anna Polantia, Simon Polantia. Her face distorted beyond expression. Richard and Anna's. The worst enemy who had forsaken her, and the woman she hated more than anyone else. The child born between the two. The traces of the two uniting. I'm saying it again, Elizabeth. As if adding fuel to a burning fire, Simon coldly said. You once belonged to my father. Stop. So, as his son and as commander of the Legion, it would be natural for me to retrieve you. Stoop. Something that she had somewhere in her heart. Something she wanted to keep buried, the thought that she forgot about already. Those rotting emotions exploded and took over her head. Eawawawa. Elizabeth twisted her entire body painfully. Her fingernails scratched and tore at her neck and shoulders, blood gushing out. Her body spread out, and six huge legs protruded from her thighs and side, stepping down to the floor. The mask covering her face disappeared, a woman with monster-like eyes taking its place. Her upper body was a human's, and her lower body was a spider's. This was the true form of Elizabeth as an undead. Die! Die! Elizabeth, who lost her mind and went out of control, jumped straight at Simon. If she couldn't get rid of this terrible remnant right now, she thought she'd go crazy. Her nails formed up with jet black grew longer, going straight at Simon's neck. And Simon just stood there expressionlessly. Well done, boy! Flap! In an instant, Simon's vision was covered by Pierre's back and his cape. A loud and clear sound of something being slashed was heard through the cape. Soon, the cape went down, and revealing Pierre wielding a greatsword and Elizabeth falling to the floor with four of her legs severed. A chance! This time, Simon moved. He held a spear that came out from the subspace in his hand. Jet black enchantment. The tip of the spear was dyed in jet black. Pierce smiled before stepping aside, and Simon leaped out like lightning, thrusting his spear. PSSSHK. But it didn't fully penetrate. 
Elizabeth held the tip of the spear with her right arm to hold it. Simon brutishly trampled on Elizabeth's face and put more force on the spear. This is the last chance. Simon said in a cold voice. Are you going to join the Legion, or are you going to perish? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Mph. She stretched out her still remaining legs like a gimlet. Pear quickly jumped in front of Simon. Slay Ash. Cough. It was so powerful that Pear's plate armor ripped like a piece of paper. Simon clenched his teeth and put strength on the tip of his spear. The corpse spiders were approaching to rescue their master between the human and two undeads fighting. And right above that. Wire. A white light emerged. Seeing that, Pear shouted. Damn it. Dodge. Soon, the light expanded at an incredible speed and landed on the floor. A dazzling scattering of light spread out and tore apart the surrounding. Ruumble. Tisk. Pier, retreating from the explosion's radius, went to a knee and put Simon down. The spiders caught in the explosion disappeared without a trace. Elizabeth was leaning against the wall gasping for breath. Looks like she somehow dodged, even with half of her legs slashed. What a waste that was perfect timing, though. Everyone's eyes turned. A girl with staff was seen from behind the collapsed wall. How dare a priest like you? Elizabeth stretched out her hand violently. The spiders on the ceiling jumped straight at her. Well, I guess I can't help it. As she swung her staff lightly, daggers of light flew and lodged themselves in the spiders' bodies. The spiders twisted and screamed as though in pain. She's strong after all. Simon's expression hardened. The old evil spirits, and disgusting swarms of spiders. I shall annihilate all of you in this place. She took something like a jewel from her pocket, threw it over her head, and hit it with her staff right as it dropped. As the jewel broke, a huge amount of divinity erupted like an explosion. Goodbye. Wow wow whoop. The expanding white light soon turned into countless daggers of light and scattered in all directions. Simon and Pierre quickly escaped by hiding behind the pillar. Heavy daggers of light indiscriminately stabbed down on the floor, and the corpse spiders splattered into blood. This is hard. Simon bit his lip. Elizabeth should be captured, not killed. Dealing with her alone was already difficult, but the spiders kept on flocking, and there was even the ethnal student. Boy! Now that it has come to this, we need to deal with that priest first. Can we win? Heh. The divinity just gets in the way, but one strike is enough for that level. Simon nodded. Elizabeth was basically captured. They'd cut off her legs and sealed her mobility. Peer hid behind the pillar. Oh my! At that moment, the priest spun her staff and smiled. Her gaze was directed at Elizabeth. Looks like your legs are in pain. Elizabeth had daggers of light stabbed all over her body, unable to dodge them with her injured legs. As the priest stretched out her staff, a pure white magic circle came into sight, and a spear made of divinity appeared from within. Mission accomplished. Whyish? The Spear of Divinity flew at a frightening speed. While Elizabeth was staring blankly at it. Stay up. Ah. It was something that shouldn't have happened. Simon stood in front of her with his arms outstretched. Elizabeth's eyes shook frantically. Kook! The Divine Spear went straight through Simon's back and out his chest. There was no physical damage but for something with a core in its body, like a necromancer or natural undead, divinity was more lethal than a deadly poison. W-H why did you? Elizabeth was still in shock. Simon fell to his knees. His vision flickered with the excruciating pain. Slowly, his vision darkened, and Simon collapsed. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Crackle crackle. Simon slowly opened his eyes to the sound of a bonfire burning. The atmosphere was so quiet, the chaos a while ago felt awkward. As he moved his head, he suddenly saw a multi-eyed corpse spider right in front of him. Simon sat up in surprise. SHH, SHHHHK. But the spider didn't attack. Rather, it rubbed its face on Simon's arm and looked up at him as if asking if he was okay. Oh! Are you awake, boy? 
Pierre, who was sitting on the floor with his greatsword sticking on the ground, smiled. Simon got up with blank eyes and looked around. They were still inside that abandoned castle. Those terrifying spiders were quietly crawling around the floor. Pierre also didn't seem to attack the spiders. Anne. Elizabeth. She had returned to her human form. She turned her head away as soon as she made eye contact with Simon. Simon remembered that she was badly injured, but fortunately, she appeared okay. Cough. Cough. The sounds of coughing rang out from above. When he raised his head, that priest was hanging upside down from the ceiling, bound in a spider's web. Why young master? Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Because of the smoke from the bonfire coming from below, she was gushing out tears and snot. Please save me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Cough. Cough. Simon let out a silly laugh. What the hell was going on? Chapter 48 Simon heard the whole story from Pierre. Simon went unconscious as he received the attack flying towards Elizabeth instead of her, and Pierre and Elizabeth formed a temporary alliance to face a common enemy, working together to capture the priest. According to Pierre, it was a very boring battle. Let her down first. Simon decided to listen to her story first. Before dying from suffocation by the smoke from the bonfire, the priest came down from the ceiling and knelt, tied in a cobweb. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I was so scared. Melting in tears, she looked as young as expected. She clearly looked like she was Simon's age, or a year or two older. I don't think it's time to say thank you yet. Answer the questions that I'll be asking from now on. Yes. Sniffle. Are you a student of Ethnol? It was quite an important question. Kizan and Ethnol were on an armistice but they were definitely in a hostile relationship, and Simon letting her go could be a problem. But she frantically shook her head and denied it. De definitely not. Kuhi! You're lying from the first question. Pierre grinned and pointed his greatsword at her. The priest's face turned pale. I'm telling the truth. Please trust me. Stand. She jumped to her feet, terrified. Pear cut off her robe from bottom to top with his greatsword. White legs were exposed through the cut robes, and a pure white skirt was visible. As it went to the top, you could see an outfit anyone would know. Ethnol's school uniform made with holy shroud, said to surpass that of Kizan's, armed with advanced defenses against dark magic. Even the pattern of Ethnol attached to the school uniform was exactly the same. Sly priests always lie through their teeth anyway. Elizabeth placed her hand on the priest's shoulder and moved her tongue. Heek! The priest shut her eyes tight. There's no need to listen anymore. Let's kill her right now and continue our talk. Trust me. The truth is, I I. She blushed and lowered her head. She then gently bit her lip and opened her mouth carefully. I was expelled from Ethnold two years ago. H.M.? So she wasn't a second year? Simon blinked at her unexpected answer. Pierre and Elizabeth looked uninterested, but Simon had a reaction. She looked at Simon with desperate eyes. Please trust me. I was indeed in Ethnol for a while. However, I'm just a mediocre commoner like anyone else and couldn't hold out in their first year, getting kicked out. Killing someone like me won't bring any benefit to Kizan. Then why are you still wearing the uniform of Ethnol? I'm sure they retrieve it when someone gets expelled. Her face turned even redder. I, I impersonated. Them. Impersonated? Yes. Times were really tough back then, and I also couldn't accept the fact that I was kicked out of Ethnol. So I forged a fake student ID and school uniform, took missions, and made money as an Ethnol student. That's it. Her expression contorted with shame and sorrow but I couldn't find any mission with rumors spreading in the Holy Federation. So I took missions in the Dangerous Dark Alliance. Are you telling us to believe such an obvious lie? Elizabeth smirked at her and grabbed the hem of her top. Elizabeth ripped her clothes as the girl looked up with a puzzled face. Ryup. Kiawea. She screamed and shrank back in surprise. Elizabeth frowned as she looked at the torn pieces of clothing in her hand. It's really nothing but fabric? 
the girl sobbed and lowered her head more. Don't be too harsh on her. Simon got up from his seat and moved toward her. She shrank even more, turning her body away so that the torn part couldn't be seen. Russell. Simon took off the robe he was wearing and covered her body. Are you okay? Cover yourself with this. Ah. Thank you. The priest's eyes welled up with tears. Anne. Elizabeth, who was watching that, immediately felt a mixture of complex emotions. I'll ask you again. Simon returned to his seat at a leisurely pace and sat down. First of all. H.M. What's your name? It was a very kind tone. She answered, quickly sitting on her knees, facing Simon. I, it's Ellen Zile. How did you get this mission? Through a middleman that goes in and out of the border. I was told that there was a high-paying job eliminating undead in the Dark Alliance. Not a word of Simon's interrogation could enter Elizabeth's head. Have you seen the lore of Arnish? Ah, yes. I heard the details of the mission from him. Do you have any evidence to prove that you received the mission from the Lord? Like documents or down payments? Everything was very annoying. Simon treating the priest kindly. The priest looking at Simon with interest and talking. Purple petals were fluttering. Elizabeth felt something overlapping between the two of them talking. The memory was still clear. The image of man and woman whispering their love to each other in a field full of violets. The man she once loved more than anyone, Richard Polantia. The woman who stole such a man from her, Anna Cross. It was like this at that time too. Elizabeth, who followed after Richard on a hunch, hid in the grass and witnessed the two of them hugging each other. She saw the necromancer and the priest kissing each other. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I thought I had forgotten it already. This feeling. This terrible thing called feeling was once again forming an eternal nightmare in her heart. Okay, this should do. Simon obtained the documents provided by the middleman, the down payment from the Lord, and even the forged ethnal student ID. Ellen also didn't care about the money as long as she could save her life. Whatever it was, she just wanted to live. Boy. What are you going to use all that for? I'm going to visit the Lord later. Simon grinned. I need to extort everything I can. Kwa. Very well, very well. As expected from Richard's son. You um. Ellen carefully asked while reading Simon's countenance. Then, can I now? Simon Polantia, was it? Elizabeth spoke, cutting off Ellen. Sure, I'll accept your offer to join the Legion. Simon's eyes widened. Really? Yes, but I have one condition. Her eyes gleamed fiercely. Suffocate that priest to death with your own hands. Right now. Ellen's face turned pale. That's my only condition. Simon raised his head and looked straight at Elizabeth. As their eyes met, Elizabeth felt her heart beating rapidly. He really looked like him. That man. She thought it was going to be disgusting. The child born between Richard and the woman she didn't even want to mention. But it wasn't. That expressionless face made her heart race frantically. It broke down the nightmares of the heart and made warm springs appear. She couldn't understand her own feelings either. Was it Richard again? You couldn't forget him in the end? Was hating him just words? Don't you have pride or anything? Half of him has that woman's blood flowing, you know? But. Elizabeth wrenched her eyes closed. She really didn't want to admit it, but. He was already irresistible to her. Former captain of the spider troops, Elizabeth. Finally, Simon's mouth opened. Tell me why I have to strangle Ellen to death. It's to prove if. I want to know if you're worthy of being my master. I know. Simon's voice was weighty. I'm asking why I have to prove my worth to you. What? You seem to be misunderstanding something. Simon slowly rose from his seat. It's true that you once belonged to my father's legion, but he's him, and I'm me. I'll form the legion with my own judgment and standards. But after observing you for a while, you're... Simon's cold voice, disqualified, pierced her chest. 
he broke her heart and set loose the nightmare of her feelings once more. Even though you're undead, you have too many emotions in your thoughts. You don't even know what's important after being swayed by your emotions. What in the world can I prove by strangling that woman? Her heart sank with the feeling of a guilty conscience. It felt like she was naked. Telling me to prove it must also be an excuse. You're just doing what you want to do. You want to manipulate me according to your impulsive and vulgar desires. I can't believe or trust you like that. There's no value in an uneasing existence like you and my new legion. Simon turned his back. Let's go back, Pierre, Ellen. The moment she saw Simon's back. Elizabeth almost unconsciously reached out her arm. Looks like. Simon's eyes as he glanced back were so cold. We wasted our precious time. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The night was getting late. Simon, who had gotten out of the abandoned castle, was heading to the Lord's castle with Pierre and Ellen. By the way, boy. Said Pierre. Are you really going to give up on Elizabeth? Her abilities are useful in many ways, you see. Hey, no way. Answered Simon with a soft smile. This is just fighting over dominance. It was inevitable in order to not be swayed by that obsessive Elizabeth. But for sure, she'll have no choice but to come to me in the future. The corners of Pierre's lips rose up. If so, don't tell me. It was all part of your plan to get struck by that divine spear? No comment. Pierre giggled. This little kid. Thinking of petty tricks just like your father. Kwaha. Ellen, who was furtively looking at Simon from the side, intervened. I'm sorry for that attack back then. It's fine, Ellen. You didn't shoot it aiming at me anyways. But is your wound really okay? Your chest was pierced by a divine spear. Simon said while touching his chest. I'm fine. Fortunately, I don't think the spear went right through my core. Ah, that's a relief. Actually, Simon didn't realize it, but the divine spear properly pierced the core. Pierre also saw it. He was going to rip both Elizabeth and the priest to pieces with the anger of losing the contractor, but when he checked the condition of Simon's core, it was intact. The Legion's contract was also unaffected. It was something that couldn't happen with common sense, so even Pierre had no choice but to think that, luckily, it didn't hit the core. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. How mysterious. No matter how much he thought about it, it made no sense. Pierre? What are you doing there on your own? Nothing. I'm on my way. Chapter 49 Simon and Ellen walked through the forest, talking about different things. During this, he was able to hear various things about Ellen. Back in the time when she was still an Ethnal, she was the type who went all in on the firepower of divinity. However, outside of her firepower, she lacked in abilities, and she was expelled from school because she couldn't use the common healing magic. It was a pretty serious reason for disqualification as a priest. When he asked her why she was furiously trying to make money, it seemed that she had lost her parents and was raising her younger siblings by herself. He was able to know a new side of Ellen. You um. Mr. Simon. He smiled. Just call me Simon. Ah, yes. Simon. Ellen had an unexplainable interest in this boy. During her time at Ethnal, she was taught that all necromancers were terrifying and horrible monsters. But this boy was different. In fact, necromancers were also human beings, and they had warm hearts. Anyways, what is it? He. Now that we have gotten closer, we formed an alliance together, and I don't even have the skills to deal with the two of you. She glanced at Simon and stretched her arms bound by ropes. So, um, could you please release this? Instead of answering, Simon still had a smile on his face. Ellen was sweating profusely. Aya. So that means no. Kuhi. So you finally went insane. Pierre glared inside the helmet. Look, boy. If you treat the captives well, they'll walk over you without knowing their place. Let's cut off some of her fingers to make her obedient. You ah. I, I am sorry. Something must have happened to my head. She quickly fell flat on the floor, and Simon stopped them. It's fine as long as you know. 
Peer, stop it too. Peer put down his greatsword, and Ellen's face returned to normal. She thought that Simon was endlessly kind, but still quite alert. Soon, they arrived at the Lord's castle. As planned, Ellen hid inside Peer's robe, and Simon and Peer approached the gate of the castle. Stop right there. Who are you? The guards of the gate raised their voices and their spears. Simon said while pretending to raise his arms. I came for the Lord's mission. I want to see the Lord in person right now. What? Did you get your head hit by an arrow or something? Meeting the Lord at midnight? Simon nodded. Yes. It's an urgent matter, so I think I'll have to see him right now. The guards gave forced laughs as though dumbfounded. Now I'm seeing all sorts of crazy bastards. Do you think that the Lord is someone you can meet whenever you want to? Get lost while we're talking nicely. No, this bastard is suspicious. Let's just tie him to that pole until the sun comes up. The guard nodded and held the rope he had on his waist. Simon said while still putting on a smile. You're going to regret this. You arrogant little brat. Who are you? Identify yourself. I'm from Kizen. The movement of the two guards stopped. Bwah. Fuck. This bastard is actually really fucking crazy. If you're from Kizen, then I'm Nephthys. You crazy bastard. The two guards walked up to tie up Simon. Simon obediently stretched out his arms as if to let them. What's the commotion? At that moment, the guard captain appeared from the wicket gate. The guards got frightened and saluted him. A, a suspicious bastard wanted to see the Lord, so we were about to arrest him. Suspicious bastard? Yes, he all of a sudden said he's from Kizen. Hearing those words, the guard captain's face turned pale. Key? Zen? Mysterious disappearances within the territory. The Lord, who wanted to hide this uneasy case ahead of an important event, secretly commissioned Kizen. Only the closest associates of the Lord were aware of this. However, there was no response even after three months, so the Lord stopped expecting anything from Kizen. But they actually came? The guard captain observed Simon's appearance carefully. Smart-looking eyes, a relaxed attitude, and even a tall, armored man accompanying him as a bodyguard. There's no mistake. Goosebumps ran across his entire body. This boy really was Kizen. Drop. Why yes? Drop your damn heads, you shitheads. Suddenly shouted the guard captain. The guards immediately put their weapons down and prostrated, hands clasped behind their backs. Simon was scratching his head from the sudden change of atmosphere, and the guard captain approached Simon with his sword drawn. What is it? Pierre grabbed the handle of their greatsword, but Simon raised his arm to stop them. The guard captain stood in front of Simon, stabbed his sword on the ground, and knelt down on one knee. The training of my subordinates is entirely my fault. I'll apologize with my neck. Then he took a pose as though sticking out his neck. The guards raised a clamor as they saw it. Gosh! How uncomfortable! Simon gave a bitter laugh inwardly. Was there a need for him to go this far, even if Simon was from Kizen? And he wasn't even a second-year student. Simon was a first-year, a cheap life who never knew when he would return to his home. If he got expelled from Kizen, he would return to being a normal person. So, he thought he was never in a position where he could control people's lives at will. Stop. Please stand up. The guard captain stood up with a stiff face. It was my fault for making a fuss late at night. The guards just did their job, so don't be too harsh on them too. Ah, please stand up, you too. The guards with sweat-soaked brows sprang to their feet and stood at ease. Simon looked at the guard captain once again and said. May I see the Lord? I have something important to tell him about the mission. Yes, of course. Please, this way. Kiki Kiki. Simon followed the guard captain, and Pierre scoffed at the guards as though teasing them. The guards couldn't even raise their heads. Does this make sense? Why would Kizen be in this rural area? It was nearing dawn. The Lord's castle went into uproar at the sudden visit of Kizen's personnel. The treatment with the utmost devotion continued as Simon entered the spacious reception room. Hot bread and food, tea, and wine were served. 
The maids even brought buckets of water and tried to wash his feet, but Simon quickly refused, it being too much for him. And after a while. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I'm honored to have you as a guest. A middle-aged man of short stature with a belly appeared, smiling widely. His face was swollen, as though he had just woken up. I'm the Lord of Arnish, Count Raymond. I'm Simon Polantia, a first-year student at Kizen. You must be exhausted after such a long journey. I heard that you came all the way here for my mission. Yes. Ha ha. I wonder how I should repay this favor. You must have accumulated a lot of fatigue from traveling. Forget about your work and please take a rest. We'll do our best to serve you during your stay. I barely had any fatigue from traveling. Said Simon, sinking into the back of his seat. I came with the teleportation magic circle. Ah. I, I see. Kissin's extraordinary, after all. Ha ha. Well, well, take a glass. It's a special product produced from the grapes of this land. Raymond drew the cork out of the wine bottle. A clear and strong smell of alcohol flew out. He poured wine into a glass and offered a toast. Come on. Sure. Raymond cleanly emptied his drink first. It wasn't polite to refuse, so Simon only pretended to drink with his lips. After a while, the maid served sumptuous dishes, such as a huge whole pig barbecue. After declining it, saying he had already finished eating dinner, Simon said. Other than that, I'd like to talk about the mission. Ah, the mission. That's important too, but it's already night time, and wouldn't it be more important to relieve the fatigue built up in your body? You wouldn't call life in Kizan a school life. It's a battlefield. Ha ha. As Raymond clapped his hand, the side door of the reception room opened. Simon was terrified. Scantily dressed women swarmed Simon. About five people also stood behind Raymond. Now, take your time to pick the one you like. Ha ha. He had nowhere to settle his gaze. Raymond grinned with satisfaction when Simon looked down at his knees, blushing. Even if he's kissing, he's still a baby beast that hasn't even grown any teeth yet. I might be able to coax him more easily than I thought. As Raymond gave the signal, the women behind him embraced Simon's shoulders and arms. The other two knelt at both sides of Simon and began pouring a drink into a golden glass. Lord. Ha ha. Yes, which one would you like to pick? I'm still a minor, and it's a bit embarrassing to be in a place like this. There was a hint of embarrassment, but the strength and will in his voice were clear. I have an important thing that I want to discuss one on one with you, Lord. Could you please return these people? Raymond gulped as he met Simon's eyes head on. Wasn't this little fellow quite powerful? There was something about him that made people shiver. I, I guess there's no choice if you say so. Raymond reluctantly made the women leave. As they turned around with bum faces, they winked or flirted with Simon. Simon thought that he'd never be able to adapt to these cultures of adults. Now, the night is getting late. If the thing that you want to talk about is the mission, then let's do it Tom or... No. I have to do it right now. Raymond forced a smile. As long as he was coming out hard from that side, it was now harder for him to pass this matter nice and gently. This was his final option. Come in. When Raymond gave the signal, another door was opened. A butler dressed in a formal uniform bowed deeply and placed the box in front of Simon. The box contained various jewels and the commission fee of fifty gold. It's the commission fee. Sorry to inform you late, but the case has already been resolved. Please have a comfortable rest in the castle for the remaining time, receive this commission fee, and return to school. That's quite different from what I found out. Softly said Simon. I bought information from the Thieves Guild. I heard that another case happened this morning. Raymond gnashed his teeth. Those damn bastards. They don't do any good after all. I can't receive the rewards before completing the mission. I don't want to be bothered by Kizan's inspection later on. Ha ha ha. I'll take care of that matter cleanly. Please tell me about the mission. You? Raymond's expression turned cold. You only stay still if I tell you to. 
Even if you're from Kizan, a first year like you is trying to go against me, a lord and a count? Walk away from this while I'm still being nice. I'm saying that I'll even pay the commission. Why are you being so picky about this? Had he finally revealed his true colors? Simon grinned. From solicitation to threats. You're playing it hard, Lord. Looks like you're too agitated. I'll be back early tomorrow morning. Let's talk again then. Simon slowly got up from his seat, the corners of his lips rising. Now, take the bait. And exactly as Simon expected, Raymond slammed his fist down on the armrest. I told you to stay here. Clunk. 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 Different doors opened, and more than ten armed guards rushed into the room. He was quickly surrounded by guards, but Simon didn't have the slightest sense of worry on his face. Resorting to force in the end. Simon pulled the imaginary lever with a relaxed gesture. Then we can't just stay still either. Way a wop. A subspace open on the floor, skeletons with blue flames swirling in their eye sockets coming out. You undead. It's undead. With the sound of rattling bones, the guards were instantly outnumbered by the conscripted skeletons. The guards' faces stiffened sharply. All the people of the continent had a deep-rooted fear of the undead and necromancers. The fear passed down through education, history, and brainwashing wasn't something you could easily get rid of. H. How many are there? And Raymond's eyes were also shaking. He heard that the measure of a necromancer's strength was their number of summons. But a first year who could control a platoon? He definitely wasn't an ordinary guy. No, it must have been a lie when he introduced himself as a first year student. Qua! Pierre took off the helmet on his head and threw it. A skull with blue flames lashing out of his eyes appeared. You heek! I it wasn't a human. Good. Very good. Looks like we'll be having lots of new additions to our family today. The loud voice resounded out. Pierce's mouth opened up like a monster's. Fear spread like a plague, and the soldier's legs trembled. Now. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Simon slowly walked up. Raymond unknowingly stepped back in terror, and Simon sat down on the Lord's seat, smiling. Will you continue? The undead cried for blood. Chapter 50 In the end, Lord Raymond retreated the soldiers and knelt at Simon's feet. He was boiling with rage inside as he was doing it in front of a boy his son's age, but there was nothing he could do in front of the undead legion. Even if it's Kizan, you'd be in trouble if you used your force like this. Still, he hadn't completely surrendered yet. The Lord strained his eyes. The Dark Alliance firmly acknowledges the autonomy of the countries and territories it belongs to. This is an area that Kizan can't be involved in. If it develops into a diplomatic issue, how do you plan to deal with it? Simon, who was sitting down on the Lord's seat, gave a faint smile. I'll get straight to the point. He took the evidence from his pocket and dropped it on the floor. The contract from the middleman, advance payment given to Ellen, and even the remains of a torn Ethnal school uniform. You seem to have secretly communicated with a priest of Ethnal. Raymond felt his blood chill to the bone. What was worse is that you did it after entrusting the mission to Kizan. In addition to treason, you led a clash between a necromancer and a priest. Can I interpret it this way? And no, that's. Simon's eyes gleamed coldly. And you said that my actions could turn into a diplomatic issue. Your actions could turn into a war across the continent with that logic. Am I right? Raymond was covered in a cold sweat. He was trying to keep Simon at the castle to prevent a clash between Kizan and Ethnal due to a double booking of the mission. But he had already been caught by Kizan's side. He was agonized. At this point, I'll end up being killed. It won't just be me either. The entire territory will be annihilated. I need to do something. At this point, it's sink or swim now. Raymond jumped to his feet. How dare you! Then, he shouted. How can a person who has no power other than belonging to Kizan discuss treason with such crude evidence? Simon let out a smirk. It was like the Lord was rushing in with his neck exposed. But it didn't really feel bad. 
he thought that watching the opponent struggle while holding all the cards by himself was quite enjoyable. Kuhihi. Your true personality is starting to reveal, boy. My head's ringing, so please stay quiet, Pier. Simon looked back at Pier and bobbed his head. Then, Pier removed the robe wrapped around his body. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Raymond's eyes began to tremble. This was wrong. This was really wrong. Revealed from Pierre's robe was Ellen. She was standing blankly, eyes glazed over. Her head was tilted and drool fell from her mouth. A magic circle was drawn on her forehead. We captured the Ethmal priest during the mission. Said Simon as though sentencing someone to death. She's unconscious for now with a curse. If we send her to Kizan for interrogation, we'll be able to draw out a lot of stories, don't you think? Thud. Raymond fell to the floor. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The situation was settled. Raymond confessed all his crimes and begged to spare at least this territory in exchange for his life. One thing that was a little surprising was that Raymond was a well-known person among the people of the territory. He risked all his political life to develop the territory and attracted investment from the merchants by running on his own feet. He even somehow managed to arrange a visit from the crown prince. But the disappearance incidents held him back. If it became an issue, there was a fear that all his plans would be in vain, including the crown prince's visit. So, Raymond joined hands with Elizabeth, who was running the information guild, and blocked all information leaks. Apparently, Elizabeth didn't realize that she was the culprit of the incidents. He also secretly commissioned various mercenaries, famous knights, and Kizan. However, there was no response from Kizan for three months, and Raymond became impatient, eventually contacting the priest through a middleman. However, Simon intervened in the request that was about to be discarded in Kizan, and the situation twisted like this. Pardon me all to hell. Raymond lay on the floor and burst into tears. To speak the truth, I didn't believe in the middleman from the beginning. They said that she's a priest from Ethnal, but I thought there was no reason for such a person to go through a middleman. I just accepted the offer out of desperation, but to think that an Ethnal priest would actually come. I was too naive about this. Simon, who was sitting down pretending to be dignified, felt his guilty conscience rise to his face. At the same time, Ellen, lying on a sofa and pretending to be unconscious, also had a face full of a guilty conscience. In fact, the magic circle drawn on her forehead was also fake. This incident was solely my fault. You can freely take my life. But please, spare this territory. Simon, who was starting to feel guilty, coughed and said. All right. I understand the situation. Lord Raymond. Let's make a deal. What? I just got here, but I have managed to like this territory. The front line close to the Holy Federation. I don't want this strategic point where we have to support many soldiers to be devastated when an all-out war breaks out. Raymond raised his head with a blank face. Of course, if things go according to procedure, Kizan will annihilate everything that was in this territory. Ah. But I don't think you caused this situation with malicious intent. I'll try to cover this case as far as I can to not damage the territory. See could you really do that? I'll try. But? Simon lowered his voice and said. It may cost quite a bit. Raymond hurriedly put his forehead to the floor and shouted. I'll pay it, even if it costs my entire fortune. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Just like that, Simon obtained 500 gold, 10 times the initial commission fee of 50 gold. He placed the huge money bag into the subspace and left the reception room with a sincere guide. What was that, boy? You only extorted a little compared to your vicious act. It's fine. I want to be satisfied with just getting this much in exchange for causing trouble. Said Simon while shrugging his shoulders. In fact, aren't all these precious taxes of the people from the territory? It's not like we're robbing bad people. The corner of Pierre's lips rose. As the son of former Legion Commander Richard, they had many similarities, but in the end, this boy had something fundamentally different from Richard. You did a great job too, Ellen. Ellen, who had been inside Pierre's robe, stuck her head out. He, How was my acting? Wasn't it good? 
Why don't you wipe your saliva off first before speaking? Eh ah. She quickly went back into the robe out of embarrassment, and Simon giggled. When he was leaving the castle relaxedly with the feeling that he had settled a case, the surroundings suddenly became noisy. Move your asses. Hurry up. Fully armed guards were rushing somewhere. What's going on? Looks like someone came to attack. Let's go check it out. Simon also ran after the guards. Looking down from the second floor of the castle, countless corpse spiders were swarming in front of the castle gate, and in front of them stood a familiar person. Simon quickly turned his back and ran down the stairs. Boy! Slow down a bit. Kaya! It hurts! Simon ran faster than the two of them and came to the front of the castle gate. The heavily armed guards were preparing for battle. What's going on? In response to Simon's question, the guard captain, who was wearing a helmet, found Simon and saluted him. It's an undead. It seems that they're trying to attack the Lord's castle. It's dangerous, so please stay in. Please open the gate a bit. I'll try going. W.H. Watt. But that's too dangerous. Simon smiled and placed his hand on his chest. I'm still learning, but I'm also a necromancer. Dealing with the undead is my job, so trust me. Hmm. Eventually, the guard captain opened the gate a little. Simon escaped through it, and Pierre and Ellen, who followed Simon, joined him. As Simon looked back and nodded his head, the guard captain nodded with a firm face and closed the gate. I didn't expect her to act this reckless. Simon started walking slowly. In front of the swarm of spiders besieging the castle, you could see a woman in a wine dress. The hostess of the Thieves' Guild, and at the same time, the captain of the spider troops, Elizabeth. What is it, Elizabeth? Simon Polantia, son of former Legion commander, Richard Polantia. I, Elizabeth, want to serve you as my master. Therefore, I'm begging for a chance to join your legion and take your test. Pierre giggled and folded his arms. Simon calmed his expression and cleared his throat. Please send away your subordinates. Let's talk in a quiet place. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Simon decided to part with Ellen before moving to his inn. He himself untied the ropes that bound her arms. There's nothing good if today's incident gets known, so please keep it a secret. She stared at Simon's face. H.M.? What's the matter? Ah, ah. You do seem a little different from the rumors of necromancers I've heard after all, you see. Pierre grinned and raised his greatsword. If you mean the stories of turning a person into a skeleton to keep a secret, I can fulfill it right now. Heek! She got startled and hid behind Simon's back. Pierre laughed out loud, and Elizabeth, who was watching from a distance, was biting her tongue and glaring at Ellen menacingly. And this. Simon held out a pouch from the subspace. It's your share of the commission that I got from you earlier. Ah. Take care of your siblings. Touched, tears began to form in her eyes while she held the pouch to her chest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. I'll never forget what you've done for me. Where are you heading to again? It's a territory called Loeren, in the Holy Federation. Yeah, I hope you'll safely get to the Holy Federation. Yes. Thank you. I'll never forget this. When Simon was about to leave, turning his back, Ellen loudly shouted. Will we be able to meet again someday? Simon shrugged. Well, next time we meet might be on the battlefield. Ha ha. Ellen thought to herself that Simon was really good at drawing the line. If I ever have to go to the Holy Federation, I'll be expecting you to guide me. Yeah. Of course. As though she was truly moved, she waved her hand vigorously until Simon and the others couldn't be seen. Not only did you spare a priest, but you're giving her money and sending her away. Yeah. What's the reason behind this? Simon smiled slightly and crossed his arms. I just thought that it'd be a good choice to make connections with a priest when I have to carry out a black request form mission someday. And, I just handed over the money to truly make her an accomplice and gain her trust. Kuhi! I can't tell whether you're good or bad by watching your actions. I wonder. Simon put his hand in his hood pocket and titled his head. 
Is it really necessary to separate it in such a black and white fashion? Half of my blood is a priest's. I have no intention of hating people just because they live on the other side, and there's no reason to do so. It's the same reason for sending off Ellen this time and extorting only a bit of money from the territory. I don't have to get extreme, right? It's fine as long as I take my profits in the middle. The corners of Pierre's lips rose up deeply. It seems that it'll take time for me to fully understand a human like you after all. Simon smiled and turned his head. Elizabeth. Yes? You wouldn't attack Ellen, who I let go safely, by releasing spider troops, would you? She flinched inside, but then lowered her head. Oh of course. As long as you know it. Simon started joking around with Pierre again. While following these two, Elizabeth was captured by strange emotions. Simon's back receiving the divine spear instead of her flickered in her vision. After being rejected by Simon once, Elizabeth made up her mind over and over again. She had no advantages for herself even if she joined the Legion. She'd just be bound by a cumbersome contract, gaining nothing. However, in the end, I'm walking toward hell again with my own feet. She had never been, not a single time, able to overcome her own feelings. Elizabeth? Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Ah, yes. I'm on my way. Still. Even if she regretted it, even if she couldn't see the future, even if the end would be terrifying. She'd make the same choice over and over again. Chapter 51 after returning to the inn, Simon presented several requirements before signing a contract with Elizabeth. To not kill humans without permission, to hunt monsters when she needs to intake bodily fluids, to not harm the people around in any way, unconditional obedience to orders, and so on. In order to insert these terms into the contract, Simon rejected Elizabeth once. In Simon's opinion, Elizabeth was more emotional and impulsive than humans. Rather than like a trustworthy mentor like Pierre, she was more likely to become the troublemaker of the Legion. He had to make sure that she was definitely under his control. And now, instead of him asking her to please join the Legion, she was asking him to let her join the Legion, so Simon had firmly taken the initiative. I'm telling you again, but if you head to Roke Island with me, it might feel suffocating in Pierre's ruins, the Forbidden Forest is your area of activity, and you won't be as free as you are now. Yes. I'm aware. Elizabeth lowered her head and said. Feel free to restrict my freedoms. I'll do anything to be with you. Wasn't this undead all of a sudden too obedient? Of course, it was convenient from Simon's point of view, but it was also a bit bewildering. All of my body and mind are yours. And I ask for only one thing in exchange for absolute loyalty. Her eyes shone. It's your affection. The pressure was rushing in. I'm a human, and you're undead. If I'm, um, you uh, want physical stuff, then. It's a different story if you want to, but I won't force you. She smiled. For now, adoring me is enough. To be honest, it was super pressuring. Things she wanted, like affection or adoration. Simon had never received such a request from anyone in his life. Tsk tsk. Pierre clicked his tongue. She's totally into you. What? Nothing. Anyways, it was pressuring in many ways, but he thought that this condition was acceptable in return for her loyalty. In the end, Simon decided to officially sign a contract with Elizabeth. Then, let us proceed. She grabbed the top of her dress with both her hands and pulled it wide open. Wah! You wah! What are you so suddenly doing? His guard being lowered, Simon got startled and covered his eyes. Seeing his reaction, Elizabeth tilted her head. Didn't you say you'll proceed with the contract? Her chest opened, revealing a black core beating like a heart. Simon peeked through his fingers and looked at her core. Ah, how lovely. How could being embarrassed be that cute? To think that he was really the same person who forced an unfair contract with a brazen face just a few minutes ago. She felt herself getting more and more excited. Now, come on. Ugh. Simon had no choice but to approach her. Then, he took a deep breath and placed his hand on the open core inside her chest. The jet black of the two then exploded and went wild. 
Kook. Ow. It was painful, but unlike the first time he signed a contract with the Legion, the time passed quickly. The jet black stabilized, and Simon's dark blue jet black could be seen flowing from her body. Kuhi. Welcome back to the Legion, Elizabeth. She slowly got up from her seat. It's been so long since I was last an undead bound by a contract. When Elizabeth reached out the tip of her hand, a spider's web shot out and stuck to the ceiling. Soon, her jet black was overlaid on her webs, and it changed its into a soft, dark blue light. Rather than an unsightly spider web, it looked like a beautiful, fluorescent interior decoration. It was amazing from Simon's point of view. It really felt like she had become undead of his possession, so he felt like he grew close with her. How is it, Elizabeth? Mmm. She smiled after retrieving her webs. It's unbelievably weak. As expected, you must be a beginner, master. Irk. Simon leaned his back against the wall, upset. Pierre giggled while looking at him. It's a little ironic to think that I became weaker after joining the Legion than when I was a natural undead. The Legion's undead were connected to the jet black of the commander, and the stronger the commander, the stronger the Legion. Of course, in the same manner, the opposite could happen too. Simon's face turned redder than ever. Pierre was laughing so hard he looked like he was about to die. I am sorry for being a beginner. Still, I'm in Kizen right now, so in a month or two, I'm sure I'll get. But. She raised dark blue jet black to her fingertips once again, and her face turned red. It's a gentle and soothing jet black. However, the wound already inflicted on the pride of the 17-year-old boy didn't heal. Simon strode over to the bed and covered himself with a blanket. I'll sleep. Kwaaaaa. You're upset. Are you upset, boy? Why would I be upset when it's a matter of the fact that I'm weak? Oh my, I've hurt your feelings, master. Please let me apologize at your bedside. Go away, both of you. Pierre and Elizabeth's laughter filled the room. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. A whopping 50 gold mission. Simon cleared the mission within a day of teleporting in when even Jane saw it as difficult. If he returned to Kizen like this, he might be questioned about how he had cleared this mission in one day, so Simon decided to stay in the territory and train the Legion as much as he wanted while he was at it. Simon, Pierre, and Elizabeth came to the northern mountain of the Arnish territory, where a large-scale habitat of orcs had formed. Well then, Master. I shall begin the tutorial for the Spider Undead. Corpse spiders, which you'll be controlling from now on, said Elizabeth while putting her hand on her waist. Spiders that had been conscripted for Simon's training were walking around her. Unlike the skeleton's eye sockets burning with jet black, a dark blue light shimmered from the ends of the eight legs. At that moment, Simon raised his hand. Oh my, master. The class hasn't even started yet. Do you already have a question? No, it's something unrelated to the class, but... Simon scratched his head. Are you going to keep calling me that master something? Ho ho ho. Are you shy? As she laughed while covering her mouth, Simon turned his head, blushing. No, it's not like that, but it's just a little. If you say so. Then I'll just call you commander. I'll proceed. She gave her signal by snapping her fingers. One of her corpse spiders spat its web out of its mouth. The main ability of the corpse spider would be the spider web ability called web. It's a binding skill as well as a movement skill. Hmm. Now, control the two corpse spiders that approached in front of you, Commander. And try shooting the web at the tree. Simon nodded and accessed the thoughts of the two corpse spiders. He then ordered. Web. Thwip. Thwip. The corpse spiders shot webs from their mouths and accurately hit the tree. The spider web spread out slightly as it was fired, and as soon as it touched the tree, it wrapped up the tree's trunk. Well done! Usually, the webs figured from the mouth are used for binding, and the webs fired from the tail are used for movement. This time, the two corpse spiders fired webs from their tails. It was shot high and attached to a tall tree, and the spiders walked a little forward to lift their bodies off the ground. As though riding a rope, the spider's body moved like a pendulum. Whoa! 
It's moving like that, but it's a lot faster than I thought. Then, it clung to the target tree and stabbed its fangs into it. It made a dent in the bark, and a green liquid flowed out. This is the basic combination. Would you like to try? Of course. Then, your target will be. Her gaze turned to one side as she looked around before grinning. All right. Let's try with those orcs. Behind the tree, two grunting orcs were approaching. Their skin was gray, their noses were flat like a pig's, and they had abnormally developed molars protruding from their mouths. Gray orcs. Monsters that ruled the nearby mountain range. They were a threat that, at one time, drove Arnish to the brink of collapse. An actual fight all of a sudden, huh? Still, since the stage was already set, there was no reason for him not to do it. Simon connected to the thoughts of the two corpse spiders, and the two orcs detected Simon, running toward him. Shoot the tail web. The two corpse spiders turned and shot their webs into the tree opposite to the orcs running. Lift up your body and dash. Dash. Tap. The corpse spiders moved like a pendulum. However, it might have been too uncontrolled. They narrowly missed the running orcs. Oh, that was close. Elizabeth, who stood in front of Simon, readied her jet black. But Simon grabbed her by the shoulder as she was about to step in and sent her behind him. Shoot! Thwip! Thwip! Cross operation. He connected to the thoughts of the spiders on the other side and sealed the movement of the orcs by shooting webs at them. Ugh! Gorg! The orcs struggled to break free from the sticky web. At the same time, the spiders that had flown to the end of the pendulum movement returned from the opposite direction and attacked the backs of the two orcs. They stuck their fangs into the orcs' necks, and the orcs fell down screaming. It worked! The flinching orcs eventually stopped moving due to the spread of poison. Awesome! Your control is quite good already. This is basic. Ugh! Yugurg! It was then. Perhaps there was an orc village nearby, but gray orcs kept appearing from the forest. There are quite a few of them. I believe it's a good situation to showcase the power of the spider troops. Oh, is it a gif? Let me out too, boy! Said Pierre's clone attached to Simon's school uniform. When Simon opened the subspace, Pierre and his skeleton troops rushed out. Since we've come this far, why don't we earn the 500 gold? What? Let's wipe out all the orc villages in this mountain range and return to Kizen. Pyr grinned as if he had been waiting for those very words. And replenish the forces of Legion with their corpses. That sounds interesting. You get to train, and you get to replenish your troops. This was why being a necromancer was good. Oink! The orcs who had lost their comrades came running with a terrifying force. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Pierre and Elizabeth prepared to fight, and the skeletons and the corpse spiders also made menacing sounds, awaiting orders. Now, let's go. Simon's face formed a toothy grin. Finally, for the first time, the stage was set to properly reveal the strength of the Legion. Chapter 52 It only took two days for Simon's Legion to devour an entire mountain range swarming with orcs. Pierre, Please get rid of the Captain Monster, one o'clock. Kuhi! Here I go! Elizabeth, lead ten corpse spiders and block the escape route behind the village. As you wish. Simon felt refreshed here. Leading a large army of undead, skillfully commanding them, reading the whole game, understanding the opponent's movements, and being a commander who finally achieved victory. So this was. Necromancy. Looking at the sight of the orc village burning under the Legion siege, Simon's heart raced. Finally, after all the battles were over, Simon entered the village. Elizabeth bowed her head politely, and Pierre was chuckling, his sword stabbed in the ground. We were able to win thanks to your good orders, Commander. Well, you guys did all the work, Eliza and Pierre. At that moment, Elizabeth opened her eyes. W.H. What did you say just now? H.M. That you guys did all the work? After that. Eliza. Ah. She closed her eyes and put her hands together. So you're finally giving me a nickname. I feel like I'm on cloud nine. 
we're so much closer now. Rather than a nickname, he just used it as a codename due to the urgent nature of the battle. Still, he didn't necessarily have to spoil her fun, so he decided to move on. Now, it's time for you to work. Pierre pointed in one direction. The corpses of the grey orcs that died during the battle were piled up like a mountain on one side. Turn all of them into skeletons. With this, the legion can become even stronger. Simon suddenly felt like he was going to faint. Should we just burn them? You crazy bastard. I'm telling you to turn them into soldiers. Ah. Come to think of it, I haven't learned that yet. That? Dark magic that raises a corpse. Until now, Simon had been assembling and using the skeleton sets sold on the market. Of course, the summoning magic was already drawn inside the skull of the skeleton set. Pierre's ability was also to conscript summoned or natural undead into a legion undead, so raising the corpse right away and turning it into a legion was out of his capability. Ha! Ah. Right. Sometimes I forget that you're still a first-year student in Kizen. Said Pierre while folding his arms. Still, don't we live in times where corpses are money? I think it's a waste to just throw them away. In the end, Simon sent a letter to the Lord's castle and asked him to handle it. Lord Raymond was surprised as soon as he received the message from Simon, so he climbed up to the mountain range on horseback to check the situation himself, coming to Simon's inn to express his thanks. They were really giving us a rough time. On behalf of my territory's people, I'd like to express my gratitude. Raymond turned this matter into a formal mission, paid Simon an additional commission, and decided to handle the orcs' bodies, sending all the profits to Simon. Kook! My soldiers! Pierre grumbled wistfully, but when Simon said that he would buy new undead with this money, he felt a little better. And the following day, Simon left the inn early. It's cramped. I and hurry. -y. Hang in there just a little bit. After shoving Pierre, Elizabeth, and about thirty corpse spiders into the subspace, he headed to the meeting point he was first teleported to. When he arrived at the meeting point, he saw a man wearing a black robe and sitting down in the shade of a tree like a corpse. Simon drew closer, but they showed no reaction. So, he took out his student ID and held it toward the man. That startled me. The student ID disappeared from Simon's hand. In an instant, the man who used inspection magic on his student ID jumped up and bowed down at ninety degrees. I was waiting for you, Simon Polantia. Ah, yes. So they were a servant of Kizan after all. Simon smiled, embarrassed, and took his ID back. This way, please. I'll start the guide right now. Yes. He saw the servant using dark magic, and after a while, a clear teleportation circle was drawn on the floor. Congratulations on your safe return. Have a nice day today. Thank you. The mission was successful, and he earned a lot of spare money to use in school life too. Simon happily stepped onto the magic circle. Let's go back. To Kizen. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After returning to Roke Island with the teleportation circle, Simon arrived safely at the Kizen campus. Hiya. It's been a while, Kizen. He somehow felt butterflies in his stomach as he looked around the familiar school buildings. To think that he'd feel so fond of this place after being away for a few days. Perhaps because he arrived a day earlier, the school was quiet. He could only see a few students passing by, chatting, or sitting on benches and reading books. The fact that my environment changed is now truly sinking in. When he was out on a mission, Simon was the only kizen, and he was treated well by people. But not here. All of the students here were kizen, and he had to compete fiercely to survive. But now, he was ready. At this point, Simon just wanted to meet his friends quickly and take his next class. Boy! What are you sentimentalizing about for so long? Let's hurry and go to the ruins. Ha! All right. It was then when Simon was about to head towards the Forbidden Forest. Simon. When he turned around at the sound of his name being called, Camabras was running towards him from a distance, waving her hand. Cammy. Simon also smiled brightly. He hadn't seen her for a few days, which made him feel happier to see her. I'm glad that you're not hurt. 
I was worried because you took on a difficult mission. I was lucky in many ways. Contrary to Simon, Camabarus chose the strategy of taking on a Roke Island mission and completing it quickly to study at school. Simon, Simon. Look at this. Tada. She turned around to show her back. Adorable bat wings were flapping behind her school uniform. I got my school uniform mended. He. Simon couldn't help but smile, looking at her innocently bragging about her school uniform while smiling. Looks way better than before. Right? Right? Yeah. By the way, wanna grab a coffee in the cafeteria? It's on me. H.M.? Ah, it's fine. I'll pay for my own. Simon grinned. My treat. I made a lot of money with the mission. Then, he showed off the money he earned from the missions to his classmate. Afterward, Simon passed through the main gate and entered the Forbidden Forest after waving to Camabras, who was going back to the library. Commander. Who was that woman from a while ago? Ah. That startled me. Elizabeth came out of the subspace and walked behind Simon without him realizing it. We're just classmates. For just a classmate, she had that annoying look when she looked at you, Commander. Simon's face stiffened slightly. You remember our contract, right? Don't lay hands on. People without your permission. Of course. I'll quietly wait at the ruins with Pierre until you come to see me, Commander. She was so obedient, to the point that he felt more anxious. She said with a smile. And since you're a master and I'm your servant, please speak to me casually. I feel uncomfortable. Ah, yeah. If you say so. Simon scratched his head and nodded. And even though this is the Forbidden Forest, sometimes keepers and people come and go. I think it'd be better for you to be in the subspace, Eliza. If you're worried about people's eyes, wouldn't this work? She tapped her chest with her fingertips. Then, the wine-ed dress she was wearing turned into a cobweb. It was as if her naked body was covered with cobwebs. So those weren't clothes, but cobwebs. Simon was surprised again. When she touched the web once more, the end material of the web began to change. A white blouse, a red-toned necktie, a black jacket, a skirt, and shoes. She perfectly reproduced Kizan's female school uniform. She smiled as she brushed off her fluffy hair. Are you satisfied? Certainly. It looks quite completed. If you need a messenger to come and pass by Kizan, call me. No surveillance magic can catch me. Elizabeth specialized in the role of a spy. In addition to changing her appearance, she possessed unique stealth skills that could escape surveillance magic. Therefore, she was the only undead that could go back and forth between the ruins and Kizan. Of course, her spider troops also specialized in ambushes. It's a good thing I brought her to Legion. The more I think about it, the more useful she is. While Simon nodded his head, Elizabeth pulled out more webs and covered her own head. Curious, Simon stood still and watched. What about this kind of appearance? Simon freaked out and stepped back. Elizabeth's body had transformed into Camabras. The puppy-like, sweet, innocent smile with the eyes and the fangs unique to the vampires sticking out. Mph, ahem. Her voice remained the same as Elizabeth's, but she began to clear her throat. Kayahak. Keeg. Q. The step of clearing her throat was quite messy. Then, after a while, she turned around and said. Simon, Simon. Look at this. Tada. Elizabeth was waving the bat wings behind her and speaking in Camabra's voice. While blushing and waving his arms wildly, Simon said. Stop. Stop. I've seen enough, so just stop. Fufu. She gave an alluring smile. I think by using this power, I'll be able to give you a lot of pleasure, Commander. Ah, shut up you guys. Pierce clone, hanging on Simon's school uniform, shouted. Stop playing around. Let's just go already. The spider bastards keep clinging to my body and whimpering. Pierce mad. Let's go quickly. The two started walking again. As though she enjoyed Simon's embarrassment, Elizabeth still hadn't changed out of Camabra's form. Eliza. 
Yes, master. Don't call me master in Cammy's voice. Understood. She returned to her original voice and chuckled. She was clearly enjoying it. Let's just talk about the Legion. We only have about 30 corpse spiders right now, right? How do we increase the number? Do I have to explore the continent and collect more spiders? Don't worry. I, the queen spider, just have to lay eggs. Simon froze. W.H. Watt. I just have to lay eggs. She suddenly blushed and pretended to grab the hem of her skirt with her fingertips. It's embarrassing to show someone me laying eggs, but if it's you, master, I can. You I, uh, Ack. Go back to your original form right now. This is an order. Pierce clone clicked his tongue when he saw the chaos break loose. It was as expected. He knew that Elizabeth would be too much stimulation for Simon right now. In the end, Simon opened the subspace and ordered Elizabeth to go inside. She had a pitiful look on her face, but it didn't work anymore. Ah, wait a second. Simon, whose face had turned red, stiffened up with seriousness. Eliza. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Yes, Commander. Can you perhaps? After getting lost in his thoughts with his chin on his hand, he spoke in a serious voice. Transform into a priest, too. Chapter 53 Simon decided to set up a trap to capture the unidentified priest who was assumed to be Ethnal's spy. He would release the corpse spiders near the Forbidden Forest, where he witnessed the priest, and put them on standby. If the priest appears, it'll be relayed to Simon immediately, and Elizabeth and Pierre will move out right away. Elizabeth will disguise herself as a priest in a high position to approach them and extort some information. I'm sorry, but if the opponent is a priest, wouldn't it be revealed quickly that I'm an undead? I heard that priests who use divinity are sensitive to the undead. I don't think it'll be a problem. They were using jet black. Jet black and divinity were completely exclusive, a person being unable to harbor both. The priest's unique power of sensing the undead appeared only when they had divinity. But that traitor priest gave up their divinity in order to use jet black. Even if they found out, it didn't matter. Pierre and the entire legion would all rush in and attack the priest. Even if it was hard to guarantee victory because the opponent was really at the level of a professor, there would be no problems in at least Pierre and Elizabeth running away. Understood. I'll start studying the appearance and behavior of upper-class priests. Yeah, I'm counting on you. He set up a trap. They probably wouldn't come back to the forest as they were likely currently cautious, but he just hoped that they'd get caught someday. Like that, Simon released the undead in the ruins and returned to Kizen. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. A new life in Kizen began again after the mission period was over. When Simon entered the lecture room after a long time, the atmosphere was several times brighter and more cheerful than usual. Laughter broke loose from everywhere, and their chats wouldn't stop. Everyone was busy trying to share the stories they had from their missions, and it seemed that today wouldn't be enough to exhaust this topic. Are the others not here yet? While going to school together, Rick complained about a sudden diarrhea and rushed to the bathroom, and Simon arrived in the lecture room on his own. As he looked around for a seat, he saw a familiar face. Maylin. While babbling with two female students, she suddenly blushed when she found Simon and quickly hid something behind her back. Maylin got angry, telling them to stop it when the two female students poked her arm while giggling. Something up? As Simon approached, Maylin flinched and took a step back. The girls also greeted Simon warmly and looked at Maylin. Well then, we might be a hindrance, so we'll be leaving now. Oh ho ho! Hey! I'm gonna kill you guys, for real. They ran to another place while laughing. After raising her head and slightly glaring at Simon, Maylin cleared her throat. You've got some nerve, huh? What? Or are you just dull or something? She gave a small sigh and held out what she was hiding on her back. Here. H.M. What she readily offered was a carrot cake packed in a pretty wrapper. Simon blinked. Are you giving it to me? D don't get me wrong. Please. I'm giving it to you because we're in the same group. She handed the cake over to Simon as if dumping it on him and pulled her arms back. 
Then, she turned away and fanned her flushing face with her hand. Thank you. But what's up with this gift all of a sudden? It's not even my birthday today. She looked at Simon with an expression asking if he really didn't know. Today is a cake day. Cake day? Yeah. A day where women give men a cake. Simon's brain started spinning fast. He has never heard of a day called cake day. When it came to anniversaries at Les Hill, there was only Thanksgiving, treats for goats day, weed plucking day, and such. Maybe it could be the city's culture. And judging from Malin's reaction, not knowing this would be dumb and bumpkin-like, so it'd be wise to just go with it and not be stupid. After understanding the situation with the train of thought, Simon smiled. So you remembered. Thanks, Malin. Her hand that she was using to fan herself became faster. It's not like I remembered. I'm giving it just because I pity you, got it? Pity? If you and Rick don't even get any from the members of the same group, then that's ov. Hello, Simon. Here. It's a lemon cake. Mine's a tea cake. Thank you for teaching me the stance in the combat magic class last time. They placed their cakes one by one on the top of Malin's cake. Simon felt a little stunned, but then said with a bright smile. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to help. Ah. The girl's faces all of a sudden turned red. I'll enjoy this. Ah, yes. A slightly awkward and strange atmosphere flew. Then, the girls waved their hands and hurriedly left for another place. Be pretty good. But everyone's, including mine, was nothing but appreciation, right? Now those three would be the loss. Simonin. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Who was it this time? When Simon turned around, Camabras, with whipped cream on her face, was running toward him. In her hand was a box with a huge cake. Ah, Cammy. She took a deep breath after standing in front of Simon. Then, she strained her eyes and held out her cake. Simon. I-I-I-V-E been causing a lot of trouble until now, T-H thank you. And let's get along well for the rest of this semester. Then, she bent over at the waist and held out the huge cake. I mean, what in the world is a cake day? She's going this far for me? Simon was feeling somewhat touched. Malin's eyes widened along with Simon's when she came up beside Simon and glanced at it. Whoa! A handmade cake? That's awesome. Camabra shook her head as she reddened even more after hearing those words. And no. It's not handmade. I just bought it from Rochest. Cammy. Simon came over and took out a handkerchief from his pocket. Then, he wiped the whipped cream off the side of her cheek. Hold on. There's something on your face. Her face went as red as it could. She disappeared from the lecture room like she was running away as soon as she handed her cake to Simon. What's wrong with her? Sigh. You. For real. Malin sighed as she touched her forehead. After those short happenings, Simon sat down and neatly laid the cakes onto his desk. Then, he let out a breath and slowly looked around. Before he realized it, the classroom was filled with colorful cakes, and a pinkish atmosphere was flowing between the men and women exchanging cakes. It turned out that the lively atmosphere Simon first felt was the joy they've seen each other after the mission, plus the power of cake day. And at the corner of the lecture room, you could see Hector. Sitting with his legs wide open, he had a very annoyed face, but contrary to the intimidating expression on his face, he was wearing a funny party hat. In front of his desk was a mountain of cake boxes. H. Hello, Hector. Then a girl approached him cautiously. She was even from another class. I, I prepared this for you. Just put it anywhere and get lost. Kiawea. She added another cake on top of the mountain of cakes and ran out of the lecture room while blushing. Simon found it amusing to watch Hector annoyedly scratching his head without being able to get angry. It must be tough for him. It was when Simon was taking out his textbook with such thoughts in mind. Hello, Simon. Simon raised his head. Ah, class president. Jamie Victoria. After doing the greetings as the class representative in Poisonous Alchemy, she was the student who got given the title of class president by the class A students. 
she had a slender impression with her short green hair, which made it hard to tell if she was a girl or a pretty boy when just looking at her face. Among cheese, vanilla, and cinnamon, which one do you prefer? She asked while rummaging through the sack she was carrying on her back. Cinnamon for me. Oh. This wasn't so favored. Thank you for choosing it. She said as she held out a cupcake box to Simon. Simon asked while thanking her. Are you giving them to all the boys in class A? Yeah. To get along well for a semester, in a sense. Then, see ya. She winked and went to another place. The two poor boys who had been sitting right behind Simon without a single cake had their eyes twinkling as if they had seen a savior as Jamie approached. Simon, you. Malin made a profound face after sitting next to Simon with her things unpacked. Didn't know anything about cake day, did you? Simon's shoulders flinched. She shook her head after being convinced by Simon's reaction. I'm telling you. This is school, a school. If you don't want to be neglected by your peers, you'd better be familiar with such basic anniversaries and trends. She had a point. But other than that, there's another anniversary like this? Of course. The next one would probably be a day a man gives something to a woman. What kind of day is it? Malin smirked. Accessories day. Simon let out a feigned smile. How unfair. Hey, do you think the girls would want real accessories with jewels in return for a cake if they had a conscience? It's just giving and receiving something like toys. Is that so? Yeah, yeah. She flashed the whites of her teeth. Of course, I wouldn't stop any boys who wanted to give me some, though. The world wasn't fair after all. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After the unsettled class preparation time was over, the first class at Kizen finally started. The first class was Jane's beginner dark magic. It was reported that all class A students returned to Kizen safely. I find that gratifying as professor in charge. Jane looked around the students and continued. First of all, there's an important announcement. She received a new document from her assistant and read it. Yes. The dual evaluation will start this week. Ah. Burden voices broke loose from everywhere. You could feel the lively atmosphere from cake day freezing up. Regardless of that, Jane continued her explanation. The dual evaluation will be conducted throughout the first semester. The rules are simple. You'll battle one-on-one -on -one with your peers. Not just class A, but till the farthest class N. All fourteen classes will become competitors. She approached the blackboard and drew a simple picture in chalk. The winner moves to the upper squad, and the loser moves to the lower squad. Upper squad 30%. Middle squad 30%. Lower squad 30%. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Lowest squad 10%. The squads will be updated every week. All students who remain in the lowest squad by the end of the first semester. She said coldly as she turned towards the students. Will be expelled. Chapter 54 It was a shocking announcement. All students staying in the lowest squad in the dual evaluation would be expelled at the end of the semester. 10% of all students would drop unconditionally in one semester, regardless of their grades. Since it takes two semesters to become a second year, it could mean that close to 20% of students could leave Kizen through dual evaluation alone. Jane continued to explain. Squad promotion and demotion are determined solely by the match's outcome. Of course, each squad has different dual evaluation points. You get more points for losing in a match of a higher squad than winning in a lower squad. Everyone, please take on the challenge with the goal of advancing to the upper squad. She placed down the chalk in her hand and turned to the students. Here's a question. Can anyone tell me the difference between the monster battle we had last time and this person-to-person -person battle? There was an arm that rose faster than anyone else at that question. Jamie Victoria. Yes, Professor. This is Jamie Victoria speaking. In monster battles, we're in a position to attack with a strategy. But in a person to person battle, there's a difference, since the opponent could have a strategy for us too. Jamie nodded and turned to the other student who raised their hand Hector Moore. This time, 
Hector, who had raised his hand, stood up. It felt like a huge hill was rising. Unlike monster battles, the range of dark magic used in person-to-person -person battles is limited. Could you please explain in detail? Skills that take a long time to cast, skills with clear trajectories or slow ejection speed, and installation trap type magic circles are difficult to use in person-to-person -person combat, so their use is limited. Similarly, Hector's eyes moved. His gaze was on Simon, who was seated far from him. The summoning magic of summoning studies isn't effective in person-to-person -person battles, since the way to counter them is clear. The opponent can ignore the summons and attack the caster directly. Very well. Jane gestured, and Hector bowed his head politely, sitting down. The important details have almost all been said. In fact, there are dozens or hundreds of differences between monster battles and person-to-person -person battles. Well then. Can anyone explain why I'm explaining such obvious things? The surroundings became as silent as a grave. From this week on, you have to change how you think. Jane tapped her forehead with her finger. You shouldn't be immersed in the afterglow of the Cyclops anymore. Loosen the screw on your head and twist your lifestyle and notions. It's not like someone will agonize on your behalf. As you take the class, keep thinking about how you'll battle your schoolmates with the cards you have. Yes, Professor. The students responded vigorously. And. The corners of Jane's lips rose. Simon felt a shiver running down his spine while listening to her. How could a person have such a terrifying smile? I'm the vice president of Kizen, but I think I did my best as a professor in charge of Class A. Class A is the only one out of the 14 classes in the first year that simulated with Avalon and did an actual battle against the Cyclops. Simon nodded. He was very grateful for her letting them experience such a great experience. But why was she all of a sudden telling us this? Let me be clear. I can't imagine another class being on top of the class A that I'm in charge of. Sparks flashed in the eyes of Jane, someone who always had a cold impression. A so-called vice president took charge of first-year students. I believe you guys won't disgrace me. Ha! So that's what it meant. Although the professors didn't really make it obvious, in fact, they were quite sensitive to the grades of their classes. The dual evaluation in particular was a system in which students from class A to class N competed, and you could immediately see the results on which classes did well and which classes didn't. Professor Jane. It was then. Rick, who was sitting next to Simon, got up from his seat with an excited face. Don't worry about it. We'll do our best so you can roam around with confidence, Professor. Malin got startled and pulled at the hem of his clothes. Hey! Hey! Sit down! Why the hell are you interfering? Let's go! Go Class A! Loud laughter broke loose from everywhere. Meanwhile, some male students responded to Rick's words and shouted as though their fighting spirit was on fire. Did you hear that? Go Class A, huh? Our students are so cute. The assistant teachers exchanged whispers and giggled. Because they'd always been following Jane and dealing with the third-year students' precocious behavior, dealing with first-year students this year felt fresh. Jane looked at Rick with an expressionless face. Rick Hayward. Yes, Professor. I'm worried about you the most. Wah! This time, the whole class burst into laughter. Rick sat down out of belated embarrassment while scratching his head. Ah, for real. I fucking hate it. You're really embarrassing. Malin sitting next to him also buried her face in her hands. That being said, to give you some advice, Rick Hayward's enchantments are pretty good. However, the question is how to make the enchanted weapon reach the opponent. If the opponent is a combat magic aspirant, you might stand a chance, but if you meet a hemomancy aspirant who specializes in ranged attacks, you'll fall without being able to lift a finger. She had a good point, so Rick nodded with a firm face. You should all think about your strengths and weaknesses, and what needs to be supplemented for a person-to-person -person battle. Yes, ma'am. After calming down from the stage, Jane signaled to the assistants. The assistant teachers began to move busily. Then, let's move. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 
the place where Class A headed was the indoor training room in the building next door. The reason Jane brought the students here was simple. Starting now, you'll have some time to freely train and think about what kind of dark magic to use in a person-to-person -person battle. The assistant teachers will roam around, so ask them if you have any questions. After hearing the words freely train, the students dispersed as if they were waiting for it. Some students did image training while using dark magic, and some students were sitting down and writing damage tables. If desired, a mock duel between the students could be performed too. A protective vest similar to that used in the Cyclops battle was being lent out by the assistant teachers. And on the other hand, Simon was leaning against the wall agonizing about the topic Hector had brought up. Dash the summoning magic of summoning studies isn't effective in person-to-person -person battles, since the way to counter them is clear. The opponent can ignore the summons and attack the caster directly. As he said, the opponent would stubbornly target Simon alone. Moreover, he was unsure whether the slow skeletons could catch up with the students running around with jet black. Crumble. As Simon's agony deepened, a skeleton suddenly fell to his side. Ah. I'm sorry. Did I startle you? A bull-haired male student rushed over and started putting the bone fragments into the box. Simon also squatted down and picked up the bones. I'll help you. Ah, thanks. The male student glanced at Simon's face. At first, he looked a little surprised, but then he gave a smile full of joy. You're Simon Polantia, right? Yeah. His eyes shone. My name is Toto Amori. I was really, really impressed with your Cyclops battle last time. I'm also a summoning aspirant, and you had something that made my heart race. Simon smiled. He stood up after putting all the skeleton's bones in the box. Are you planning to use this skeleton in the dual evaluation? Th that's. Toto scratched the side of his head and smiled timidly. Actually, I have no choice. I'm only good at summoning, and I got into Kizan thanks to it. I'm pretty bad at other subjects, you see. Having said that, Toto looked up at Simon. I envy you, Simon. You're good at combat magic. And you seem to be quite talented with curses too. Simon blinked. I'm also a summoning aspirant just like you, though. That's why I'm envious. If you want to survive as a summoning aspirant, you have to do well in subjects that are advantageous to person-to-person -to -person combat such as combat magic or curses. Simon folded his arms. So that means, summoning isn't so good for person-to-person -person combat. Yeah. It can't be helped in the beginning. After all, summoning requires more time. At that moment, a female student who seemed to be Toto's groupmate waved her hand. Toto also waved to her and said, Then, I'll get going. Good luck. Simon got lost in his thoughts while looking at Toto as he got far away. Summoning is weak in person-to-person -person combat, huh? Of course, it'd be a different story if he used the Legion and wiped the opponents out, but that'd be impossible. Simon could only use his three summon-type skeletons in the dual evaluation. Even after Toto had left, Simon leaned his back against the wall and pondered over and over again. Oh my! It looks like you have a lot of thoughts. Perhaps she was concerned about Simon, but this time, an assistant teacher approached with a smile. Simon quickly bowed his head and said, Hello, surprised. What's the matter? I spent almost two years at Kizan too, so you can ask me anything. Ah, um. Simon gave an awkward smile and scratched his head. I'm just wondering about what style to fight with in the person-to-person -person battles. Fufu. She folded her arms. In my experience, at times like this, it's best to try it yourself rather than worrying about it. What? She handed him the protective vest. Put it on. I'll spar with you myself. Suddenly, Simon happened to have a mock duel with an assistant. The two went to a large space so that other students wouldn't be disturbed and stood facing each other. You can check the barrier gauge with the blue scale on the vest. Can you see it? Yes, I can. Battling against an assistant teacher out of the blue. Simon was stunned, yet nervous at the same time. You don't have to be too nervous. I'll only use dark magic at the level of a first-year student. Are you ready? Yes. Then, 
Here I go. She spread her palms out. Jet black rose like a haze and formed four magic circles in the air. Simon looked at her with his eyes lit up. A jet black arrow. He learned it in the mechanics of jet black class. One of the most basic means of attack with jet black. It was a common technique that most of the first years used as a long-distance poking. So she really is going against me at the level of a normal first-year student. As the assistant teacher opened her arms, three jet black arrows flew in. Simon, who took his stance, quickly checked the trajectories of the projectiles, and jumped back. PSSSHHHK. Three arrows pierced the floor. And the one remaining arrow was flying in the exact direction of Simon's jump. It was impossible to suddenly change the direction of the jump. Simon clenched his teeth and stretched his hand out. Phew! A short sword protruded from the subspace on the floor. He grabbed it and swung, parrying the jet black arrow. Oh! Pretty good. It's my turn this time. Three skeletons came out of the subspace and dashed towards the assistant teacher. She cast another jet black arrow and fired it, and Simon strained his eyes. Dodge to your right. Wish. Wish. Skeletons moved nimbly. One was hit by her, and the other two managed to dodge and narrow the distance with her. Hmm. She clenched her fist. Her seemingly soft fists were dyed slightly black. Swing. She swung her fist after dodging the skeleton's spear by bending her head back. When she hit the center of the skeleton's body, bones were scattered in all directions with a band. She then lowered her stance and smashed the skull of a skeleton approaching from behind with her elbow. Ah! Are you really supposed to space out like that? Clunk! Simon's stomach was bent backward. Before he realized it, some black streak of light pierced through his chest. Crap! An exhaust curse. His body suddenly became heavy. I was careless. I could have dodged it. The assistant teacher used one hand to draw Simon's attention seamlessly while dealing with the skeleton, and prepared an exhaust with the other hand hidden behind her. She also fired it right at the moment where Simon took mental damage from his skeleton getting smashed. What she's using are just basics. But her skills are way different. Simon clenched his teeth. Now I took down the summons and also placed an exhaust. Isn't this a great chance to take down the summoner? She came running to Simon while even relaxedly narrating. Simon sent out three skeletons from the subspace again. Stop her! The moment when the distance between the skeletons and her was narrowing. Whoosh! Jet black spurt from both of her legs like geysers, leaping over the skeleton in an instant. Jet black stepping from combat magic. After leaping over the skeleton, she kicked into the air and came down towards the caster, Simon. It won't be painful since you have the barrier. Her fist thrusted down at a tremendous speed. Simon's eyes shone. Folding his shoulder toward his chest, he made the fist roll flow off of him like water. Humph. She knew from the start that this student was skilled in combat magic. The assistant smirked and gently spread her left hand. The magic circle of a jet black arrow drawn on the palm was aimed towards Simon's head. This is the end. At that moment, she felt goosebumps rise up from all over her body. Simon's right shoulder wasn't folded, but turned excessively, and at the same time, the heel of his right foot was lifted, and his left foot was approaching from the opposite angle. It's not a guard, but... The tip of his left foot, visible in her sight, became a black flash of unfathomable speed and swept over her face. A spinning kick. Y-E-I-E-E fish. Simon's legs passed through her face while drawing a savage trajectory. A shockwave spread around, and the students who were practicing nearby looked at the two in surprise. Simon, who performed the kick, was also surprised. I thought it went in cleanly, but my leg just passed through her head. The two paused for a moment, then quickly fell apart. Oh, um. I'm sorry. The assistant teacher bowed her head and apologized. I said that I'd only use basic dark magic, but I ended up using my major skill, ethereal form. Ah ha ha. Let's stop the mock battle here. Thank you, assistant teacher. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only.
and at this time, the assistant teacher was looking at Simon like she'd seen a ghost. What is this kid? He's scary. Wouldn't it have been a straight trip to the underworld if she got struck without a vest? The assistant teacher swallowed down her saliva. Chapter 55 No matter how scary Simon was, she had to do her job. The assistant teacher stretched her palms. There's a reason why I insisted on a mock duel. People like you who don't know their talents can eventually find the answer by pushing themselves to the limit. You know what you depend on in the most dangerous and critical moments. Ah. In your case, you started with the summoning with your own will, right? However, when you started to get cornered, you started using combat magic without any hesitation. You do seem to have a talent for it too. Is there even a need for you to think more? Simon felt like he was stripped naked. To answer her with, I simply used combat magic because you got close to me. Simon was preparing for close combat after finishing his jet black body enhancement while sending out three skeletons. It was almost like an instinctive movement. I'm not telling you to give an answer right away. Think about it slowly. Thank you, assistant teacher. After Simon left, the assistant teacher let out an internal sigh of relief. Just then, from afar, she saw her senior assistant teacher guiding a student. The senior was wearing a protective vest, and a student in the same protective vest was lying on the floor with a blank expression on their face. It looked like they had also done a mock duel. The student who listened to her advice also thanked her and left. Now was her chance. You are. Big sis. The assistant teacher ran to the senior and jumped into her arms. I was so scared. The senior pushed away from the junior, talking with a lisp and making a fuss while frowning. Because you started off the duel guidance, all the students are asking for a mock duel. How burdensome. Sniffle. Other than that, what's so scary? The assistant teacher reached out and pointed at Simon as though complaining to her mother. Simon was in the corner by himself, lost in his thoughts. Ah, Simon, the special admission number one. I thought he's just a cutesy one, but he's so scary. It's the first time I've ever felt my heart sink when up against a kid. She folded her arms as she pushed away from her whining, immature junior. So, what kind of guidance did you give to him? I asked in a roundabout way why the hell are he was obsessed with summoning when he's fucking good at combat magic, and why doesn't he focus on that? Something like that. Hmm. Certainly, with some of the summoning magic learned in the early part of the first year, they'd inevitably be falling behind in the dual evaluation. There were several subjects that were advantageous in the early dual evaluation, and typically, they were curses or combat magic. Summoning and necromancy were subjects that needed a little more time. Is he thinking because he's a summoning aspirant? But then again, now's the only time when you can have those kinds of posh person problems. There was no use telling him about it yet. She thought that, if he fell into a lower squad and became more desperate, his mind would change. Or if not, then like a genius. She thought of Simon fighting the Cyclops for a moment in her head. He might come up with a new method. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After the mock duel with the assistant teacher, Simon felt that his mind had become more complicated. It feels like two different thoughts were clashing with each other. But if there was one thing that became clear, skeletons aren't enough in this duel evaluation. He slowly recalled the duel with the assistant teacher. To be honest, the skeletons weren't any help. Rather, they were used against him by the opponent as a means to set a curse on Simon. He needed to change. In order to survive here, he had to constantly change and grow. It was a moment when Simon was assigned with a new task. Simon. Simon, who'd been agonizing deeply, raised his head. Camabras was approaching while waving with a bright smile. Rick and Malin followed from behind, side by side, quarreling as if something had happened again. Heh <laughs> heh. How come you couldn't even land a single blow? Malin teased him by sticking out her tongue, and Rick ground his teeth with a frustrated face. Ah, I just went easy on you because you're a girl. Yeah right you're nothing but a guy who couldn't land a blow. Before Rick could rebut anything, Malin chuckled and ran to Simon's back. By the way, Simon, you said you had something to think about by yourself, but you were suddenly fighting with the assistant teacher. Yeah. 
Somehow it just happened. Did you win? Simon awkwardly smiled and scratched his head. How can I beat an assistant teacher? While saying that, Simon's eyes turned to the assistant teacher. At the same time, she was also looking at Simon, but when their eyes met, she could be seen running away to someplace else. What's wrong with her? Simon tilted his head. Ah by the way, isn't this dual evaluation too stressful? Said Rick while scratching his head. Not all necromancers are fighters. There are scholars and researchers. Even if it's a long-standing tradition, this is too dumb. Camaburas nodded timidly, as though agreeing with him. On the other hand, Malin smiled with half-lidded eyes. It must be stressful because you're weak. I said I went easy on you a while ago. Malin snorted. This is my opinion, but even if you're a scholar or whatever, if you're ranked in the bottom 10% of combat ability, you simply don't have the skills, disqualifying you as a necromancer of Kizan. At those words, you could see Camabra's head falling sullenly. The wings fluttering behind her also drooped. Ah! Belatedly being conscious of Camabra's, Malin approached while sweating profusely. And no! I'm not saying you are. You're a vampire, and you're from that great Ursula family. But I'm not that confident in fighting. Don't worry. I'll take responsibility and train you. While the two girls chatted, Rick sighed deeply and came to Simon's side. But it must be good for you, since you're not burdened by the dual evaluation. Nah. I'm also worried. He. Really? As I roamed around a bit, everyone seemed like they definitely wanted to avoid dueling with Y. At that moment, Simon's eyes lit up. As his right hand went up next to his head, something flew in and slammed into his hand. Po. Huff. Rick gasped in surprise. Dust was scattered all around because of how strong it flew in. Simon glanced to the side to see it. It was a protective vest. Step. Step. Simon Polantia. Hector came. Behind him were his faction members, giggling while following him like bodyguards. Wear it. Let's fight. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After letting out a small sigh, Simon adjusted his grip on the vest. And. Pool. The vest flew at a tremendous speed and hit Hector's hand this time. He barely reached out and caught it but beads of sweat fell from Hector's forehead. Get lost. I don't feel like giving you attention right now. This bastard. Hector's face turned red. Veins spurted from his neck, and his fists were stained with jet black. Enraged, he strode closer, and Simon also raised his head without avoiding him. Don't do it, Hector. At that moment, Malin jumped in and stood between Simon and Hector. No one to interfere, Ivory Tower. Coldly said Hector. You're not even a kid anymore. Why are you doing this? If you keep doing these kinds of asshole moves, I'm going to call the professor. Hector's lips trembled in anger for being interrupted before mumbling. You're nothing but an underling of Serene. The atmosphere instantly turned cold. Rick opened his eyes wide, Camabra's face turned pale, and the faction members flinched, turning to Hector. And above all, Malin flipped out. The dark flare magic circle was spreading out across her palm. That's dangerous. Hector wasn't wearing any vest, and the student protection period had already ended. Besides, if she cast an attack spell against a defenseless Hector during class, it wouldn't end with just disciplinary action. Simon quickly ran toward her. Hector stood still, smirking as if telling her to do it if she could. Stop. Simon, Malin, and Hector paused at the same time. Before anyone knew it, the assistant teacher came in between them and smiled. Is there a problem? They approached so fast that no one could notice them. In the midst of this, Simon quickly covered Malin's palm, and Hector bowed politely. Nothing, assistant teacher. We're sorry to bother you. Hector was a tyrant among students, but from the point of view of professors and assistant teachers, he had a strong image as a respectful and polite student. Hector turned his back and muttered, Let's go. His followers glanced at the assistant teacher and Hector before quickly following after Hector. Hmm. 
the assistant teacher turned to Malin. Malin briefly paused, then quickly lowered her head. Hector, Malin. I'm warning both of you, be careful. You just almost did what Professor Jane hates the most. Fortunately, the assistant left without making a fuss. Rick let out a deep sigh as the suffocating atmosphere loosened up. Ah, I want a fucking smash in Hector's head. Like, just once, for real. That crazy bastard. Maylin. Are you alright? Ah, yeah. I'm fine, Cammy. She said while taking a deep breath. I just, um. Lost my composure there a little. It didn't seem like just a little. Malin raised her head and said. And you? Yeah? It's embarrassing, so could you please let me go already? Simon was still holding her hand. Simon nodded his head and let go of her hand as if nothing had happened. Sigh. For goodness sake. She approached and grabbed Simon's hand with both hands, turning it so that the palm of his hand could be seen. You're really nuts, aren't you? It was a dark flare magic circle, and you just grabbed it with your bare hands? Simon just smiled bashfully. Malin's face stiffened and she grabbed Simon's wrist. I'm gonna take him to the infirmary for a while. Ah, yes. Take care. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. They went to the infirmary and received treatment. Thankfully, it was just a minor burn. After some ointment and a bandage was applied, the two came down to the training room again. Simon. Yeah? Why did you cover my palm? Simon shrugged. You're asking something obvious. If the assistant teacher found out that you were trying to use magic, you'd be in trouble. She cleared her throat. Then. Thank you, Malin. The two of them spoke at the same time. She turned her head away for stepping in, stopping me and Hector from fighting. And then you almost had a fight with Hector, but this time I stopped you, so I guess that makes us even now. Simon giggled, but Malin had a very complicated expression on her face. That's the problem with you, Simon. You're too kind. Do you know that? It feels creepy that you're being careful. However, she marched over and grabbed Simon's shoulder. It won't work this time. Then she took a deep breath, closing her eyes as though determined, and shouted. T-H-N-K-Y-O-U. After shouting that, she ran to the training room, as if running away. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Recovering from being stunned momentarily, Simon giggled. Like father, like son. Pierce clone clicked his tongue. Simon pressed his finger against the clone's lips to signal him to be quiet. Chapter 56 The next class started right after the first ended. Today, Class A had four two-hour classes scheduled, and the second class was necromancy. With spirit. Let's give a shout of concentration and start off today too. Shouting loudly in the middle of the classroom was a man named Umbra Warframe. As a unique feature, his body was a bit more blurry than usual, and his legs were nowhere to be seen, leaving him floating in the air like a ghost. Believe it or not, apparently, he often went back and forth between the real world and the spirit realm, being too absorbed in it, and eventually became like that. Then, he wore a lifelike wolf mask on his face. Because of how lifelike it was, rumors circulated among students that it was his real face, and that Umbra was a mixed-blood werewolf. Necromancy taught by Umbra was the study of the body of the soul called spirit. Everyone thought it'd be a very delicate and silent class but they were completely mistaken. You lack the guts. Your mind is completely rotten. Why are you already deciding that you can't do it? Come on. Raise your arms. Umbra was a passionate professor. Contrary to his limp, ghostly body, he was full of strength and energy. Simon woke up more than once to Umbra's explosive voice when he was trying to concentrate to feel the spirit. A student once asked. Professor. No matter how hard I try, I can't feel the spirit. What should I do? Umbra answered. Feel it. Don't think that you can't. Feel it. Just feel it. You're not trying hard enough. With all your strength and heart. Pour your energy. It wasn't very helpful advice. 
However, Umber's words weren't that wrong, because feeling the spirit wasn't a problem that could be solved with power, knowledge, or technique. The ethereal connection that responded to spirits was different for each person. Whether or not you could feel a spirit with a small ethereal connection was also case by case, dependent on the individual's constitution. And Simon, who was never left out when it came to talent. Why can't I feel it? Was poor at necromancy. Simon diligently spun an occult tool called the Ouija board with the students seated around the circular table. It's my turn to recite the spell, right? said Jamie Victoria in a hoarse voice. Even her, the honorary class president of Class A who excelled in all subjects, still couldn't feel the spirit. The basis of necromancy was spirit. Any class would be meaningless unless you could feel it. So Umbra split the class into two teams. The first team was a training team that learned the operation of spirit while following Umbra's lessons. The second was the preparation team. As they couldn't feel the spirit yet, they repeated only the actions to feel the spirit with various tools throughout the class. Rotating the Ouija board for the entire period of the class, performing bizarre dances to summon spirits while holding occult tools, going inside a coffin like a corpse, meditating, obviously, you'd get scolded if you fell asleep or dozed off, and repeating these odd activities. You have no guts. Occasionally, Umber gave practical exercises to the training team and came to see the status of the preparation team. Exert more spirit. While five students were spinning the Ouija board, putting their hands on the handle together, Umber grabbed the handle with his large hand. Grab the handle harder. Like this. Like this. Spin it with all your might and utmost sincerity. Yes, sir. He was so powerful that he overwhelmed five teenage students just by himself. Your voices are low. Yes, sir. Jamie Victoria closed her eyes and began to recite the spirit summoning spell in a loud voice. After nodding with satisfaction, Umbra's gaze turned away. What? You! What are you doing right now? Umbra's gaze turned to Camabras, who was sweating profusely while doing the ritual dance this time. Startled, she said. I, I am sorry, Professor. Raise your legs more. Higher, higher. That's right. The ritual to call a spirit isn't child's play. Make your movements bigger. Yes, sir. Small tears welled up in her eyes as she swung her knees and performed the bizarre dance. Her whole body was drenched in sweat. To be honest, it wasn't really a dance suitable for a girl. Shaking your head wildly, moving your shoulders back and forth, crossing your arms in a cobra shape and swinging them up and down. It was hard to understand how the hell it was a spirit summoning dance. The students had already given it nicknames, like chicken feed dance, or squid courtship dance. Pee poor Cammy. While Simon was looking at her with a pitiful expression. All right. Assistance. It's time to swap. Yes, Professor. The assistant teachers approached Simon and the group who were spinning the Ouija board and said. Please leave everything on your seat and stand up. We'll move to perform the ritual dance. The time had come. Simon sighed inwardly and stood where Camabras had been dancing before, the place covered with sheets at the back of the lecture room. This also had things like position, so students had to stand facing each other, a small distance apart, and in front of Simon stood Jamie Victoria, a female student of all people. I believe you've memorized the dance by now. We'll start. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The assistants started playing strange instruments with skulls. Tootle too. A strange sound of a flute was heard. Let's just empty the mind. Frankly speaking, it wasn't a dance you could do with a sane mind. Simon emptied his mind and danced, moving his body as he learned. His legs went forward and then rose up until his knees almost touched his chest. His arms and legs waggled like a wave, then his upper body stretched out, and his whole body wiggled like a mollusk. The students who slightly opened their eyes to check on Umber's countenance let out a simper as they saw Simon's passionate dance. What is he? Why is he working hard on these things too? He's good at everything you do with your body. Simon began to dance as his body and mind thoughtlessly became one. In fact, he was at the level of oneness between the ego and the outside world. 
Seeing him, Umbra also laughed with satisfaction. Very good. Excellent. Even if you can't feel the spirit, you just need to have that kind of dedication and effort. Umbra thought that he should take Simon to the 50th anniversary of Goliath's death scheduled for this weekend and assign him a part-time job for the dance of the spirit. He was really good at dancing. He's complimenting me, but I'm not happy at all. Simon opened his eyes slightly while dancing diligently. Class President Jamie Victoria was doing a chicken feed dance with sullen gestures. Her face flushed red with embarrassment when their eyes met. P please don't look this way. At her plea, Simon quickly turned his head. It wasn't like the students didn't have anything to complain about having them do this. They just couldn't dare protest against Umbra, timidly complaining to the assistants. And every time they complained, the assistant teachers said the same thing. If you don't like it, go to the training team. It was a roundabout statement saying that the students of the preparation team were there because their skills weren't enough, so they couldn't fight back. Besides, the most surprising thing was the fact that there were one or two students in a class who actually felt the spirit and raised their hands while dancing the chicken feed dance and spinning the Ouija board. Congratulations. You may proceed to the training team. Finally escaping from this embarrassing hell and moving to the training team, the students yelled out a cheer with faces like they were on top of the world. At this point, rumors circulated that the students felt the spirit from clenching their teeth out of not wanting to die of shame rather than the effect of the occult ritual actually being good. And just like that, the dreadful necromancy class was over. Ugh. After finishing the course of the preparation team, Simon was walking down the hallway, limbs waving like a mollusk. Hey, are you really all right? Asked Malin in surprise. Simon raised his limp arm and gave a thumbs up. What did the training team learn? Offensive magic, of course. Answered Rick, who was walking on the left with his hands resting behind his head. It was hard to believe, but Rick also managed to get a feel of the spirit in the first class. Because of the dual evaluation, all the professors are teaching offensive spells that can be used immediately instead of theories. I believe it's the same for other classes. H.M. What's our next class again? Rick replied with a smirk. It's hemomancy. The class had been postponed until now due to the overlap of Silage's mission schedule and personal circumstances. It was the first class for Class A today. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The hemomancy class was held in the magical bullet shooting range building. The professor was the famous Silage Basabar. That middle-aged professor who guided Simon on the nether whale and brought him to Kizen. Like a patient fighting disease, a face pale, cheeks sunken, and hands yellow, he now had more white hair than black. Simon thought that his condition had become worse than when he first saw him. Cough, cough. Hemomancy is a dark magic that uses blood as a medium. Seven students, including Simon, stood in the firing range. A target was attached 200m in front of them. It's known by the public as a study to the extent of reproducing the secret arts of vampires and blood wolves, but that's not true. As the most compatible substance for jet black is the caster's blood, it has a long history. The students in the firing range were preparing to shoot, and the rest of the students were listening to Silage's explanation from their seats. The jet black and its operator's blood are compatible in one way or another. Necromancers can artificially mix jet black and blood to create various magical reactions. Silage spread his hands. Drops of jet black flowed from one hand, and blood flowed from the other. When drops of blood and jet black met in the air, they provoked a fierce reaction and bounced around with great speed. Exclamations broke loose among the students. Cough cough. Outside of being a hemomancy professor, I can confidently say that it's a waste of power for a necromancer to not use blood. Although the caster's stamina is consumed, hemomancy can be a necromancer's fastest and most powerful weapon. Under the control of the assistant teachers, the students standing in the firing range held their right hand closed, pointed with their index fingers, and aimed at the target. All of them had an four-like device on their arm, and when the assistants operated the device and spread the magic circle in front of the student's finger, the magic circle was dyed red with blood. This was the basic skill of hemomancy, blood bullet. 
To put it simply, the Four device was sort of a hemomancy version of the magic circle rectifying tool. Kim. We've been delayed a lot since today is the first class for Class A. In today's class, we'll find out what kind of blood you have, how this blood can be a help, and finally, we'll try to use the blood bullets in action. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Even if we were delayed, how many things were we doing simultaneously? Simon looked at the target 200m away with those thoughts in mind. Not only was one target there, but up to 10 were standing further behind it. Silage turned around while folding his arms behind his back. Well then. We'll move on to the actual training. Chapter 57 Well then. We'll move on to the actual training. First shooter, ready. Yes. First shooter, Karel Oxera, ready, sir. Karel answered as the assistant teacher had told her in advance. Silage continued. Commence shooting. The moment she activated her magic circle, a bullet of both jet black and blood shot out from her fingertips. The bullet hit right in the center of the target with a poof. The blood type is AP5. The penetration is 45 mm in diameter. Three targets were penetrated. An assistant teacher reported right away. When Silage nodded and activated the mana projector, the students sitting outside the firing line also saw the target Karel Oxra had hit. The AP5 blood type has the property of contracting when it comes into contact with jet black. Silage spread out his palms to shift his jet black into a balloon-like clump, and then poured a drop of AP5 blood on it. Then, the jet black quickly gathered around the blood. It has good penetration, capable of compressing jet black to the extreme, but it's more specialized for building than for emission. It can help form a magic circle, so it's a specialized type for the support of jet black. Silage turned his head again and looked at Corel. You may go back to your seat. Ask the assistant teacher to give you an AP5 name tag. Yes, sir. Thank you. Everyone else, you must also wear your name tag on the right side of your chest in the next hemomancy class. Next, second shooter. Why yes. A voice of a very nervous girl was heard. Second shooter, Camabra's Ursula. Ready, sir. A small smile appeared on Silage's expressionless lips. Ursula family, ha. Huh? So she's a vampire. Camabra is aimed at her target, arms trembling. Since it was her first class in her major, she looked very nervous. Moreover, it was a vampire's turn, a species known as the Emperors of Hemomancy, so everyone was focused on her too. Do your best, Cammy. Simon, who was sitting sixth in line, was also supporting her silently, and Camabra's eyes suddenly turned toward Simon. It was like his support actually reached her. With a smirk, she turned her head back and stared at her target. Commence shooting. With Silage's instruction, she activated the magic circle. Blood and jet black that flowed from the tip of her finger held together and shot out like a bullet. Poof! Then, something incredible happened. The moment her blood bullet hit the target, it exploded without penetrating them. For nearby targets were swallowed up in the explosion and destroyed. Whoa dash! The students waiting in the firing line burst out in exclamation. Students who were sitting at the desks were also sticking their heads out. The blood type is KP1. Estimating the diameter of the penetrating mark would be meaningless, and there are four targets destroyed by the explosion. On the screen of the mana projector, you could see the four targets completely shattered. Silage continued his explanation. KP1 blood tends to explode when combined with jet black. In terms of attack power alone, it's the strongest among currently known blood types. It's a type that only vampires have. Silage added, turning back to Camabra's firing range. Looks like I'll see you more often from now on, Camabra's. She got in Silage's favor. Camabra's said a loud thank you, moved. Some students murmured in jealousy. As expected from a vampire. Her lineage is crazy. It's Ursula. There's nothing we can do about it. Then, in quick succession, the third and fourth students shot their blood bullets. They all had different blood types, and Silage explained the dark magic that was compatible with each type. And after a while, 
Now, next student, get ready. Yes sir. While the fifth shooter was going, the assistant teacher approached Simon standing at the sixth firing range. Excuse me. It might sting a lie at all. As she activated the four device attached to Simon's arm, he felt the blood rushing from his body to the tip of his finger. Moments later, she spread a magic circle on the tip of his finger, and Simon's jet black and blood flowed out, staining the magic circle red. Now, good luck. The assistant teacher cheered in a small voice. Sixth shooter. Then he heard Silage's voice. Simon quickly came to his senses and said, Yes, sixth shooter, Simon Polantia, ready, sir. Finally, his turn came. Simon closed his left eye and stretched out the tip of his index finger, aiming firmly at his target. Commence shooting. His mind went blank as Silage gave his instruction. The moment his concentration reached its peak, Simon activated the magic circle. A blood bullet shot out, his hand being pushed back by the recoil. Whoosh! However, the bullet that Simon fired suddenly vanished. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Simon and the students who were watching while holding their breath blinked, wondering what was going on, and Hector's faction burst into laughter. Ah! What's that? A dark magic where the bullet disappears? It was then. The blood bullet that disappeared in the middle appeared before the target while emitting blue light. Crockle. As the blue light collided with the target, the firepower spread out in a fan shape. Two of Simon's targets were torn, and one target from the fifth range on the left, and one target from seventh on the right were also destroyed. Silage had also never seen a blood bullet that spread out in a fan shape the moment it reached the target. The assistant teacher shook her head in bewilderment and said, No matching blood type was found. It's a new type. Clamors. Silage raised his hand to silence the students and open his mouth. Hit targets, two in front, two to the left and right. It's a type that I'm seeing for the first time, so I can't really explain it. Next, the seventh shooter. Please get ready. Silage immediately proceeded with the next shooting. Simon was just puzzled. Could there be a type that a hemomancy professor had never seen? As Simon came out of the firing range, the assistant teacher who was distributing name tags scratched his head. I don't have any name tags for you. I'll prepare a new one for you in tomorrow's class. Ah, yes. Simon returned to the seat where Rick, Malin, and Camabras were waiting with puzzled faces. As soon as Simon arrived, the three interrogated Simon. Hey, Simon. What is it now? I don't know either. I just did what I was told. A new type. That's amazing, Simon. Mmm. Meanwhile, Rick folded his arms with a worried expression. New type sounds cool since it's kind of special, but I'm worried about your future. Doesn't this mean you won't have any guidelines in hemomancy? Ah. In hemomancy, even with the same spells, you'd have a very different training method for each type of blood. Because of that, hemomancy had more assistant teachers than any other subject, and students were required to put on their name tags with their types on them. When Silage presented the overall direction, the assistant teachers informed the students with detailed tips suitable for their blood types. What's gonna happen to me now? Simon couldn't help but worry about how his hemomancy classes would be from now on. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After the hemomancy class was over, Silage was replaying the video of Simon's blood bullet taken on the mana projector. I knew it. I'm certain. The characteristic of Simon's blood was multiply. There was no special action the moment the jet black and blood met, but the jet black ate the blood, increasing in capacity and power. The blood bullet flying and seemed to disappear in the middle because the jet black ate the blood and the bullet became invisible. Even then, the jet black hit the target, and damage occurred properly. Interesting. An ability that was completely opposite to that of vampires, including Camabra's Ursula. The powerful blood of vampires consumed jet black and increased in size, but in the case of Simon, jet black consumed blood. He's a really interesting case. This is definitely worth researching. Silage closed his eyes and leaned back into his chair, getting lost in memories. 
Now I understand why Bahil worked so hard. Just a few days ago, Silage and Bahil met in the professor's lounge. Professor Silage. I have an offer to make. Certainly, Bahil at that time was more polite than usual. Do you know this student named Andrea Saki in Class B, which I'm in charge of? There's no way I wouldn't. Instead of answering, Silage took a sip of tea. She's a half vampire, but a curse is aspirant. It's true that she's quite a gifted student in curses, but she scored higher in hemomancy on the recent test as well. A premium one since she's a vampire too. Click. Silage put down the teacup and glared at Bahil. So? I'll persuade Andrea to major in hemomancy. She's a student who'll be a great strength to you in the future, Professor. You've always been arrogant, even as a student. Silage's eyes turned fierce. Know your place, even if you got into the crow. Bahil bowed his head politely. Of course, it was only his actions. His eyes didn't show any signs of succumbing. I'm sorry if I sounded arrogant. I just wanted to help you, as your old student. Ha! Huh. A student who stopped studying hemomancy as soon as they entered the second semester. Professor Silage, there's only one thing I want. Bahil's eyes lit up. Please give up on the recruitment of Simon Polantia from Class A. That's my only request. When he first heard it, he thought it was odd because it was an unprofitable trade for Bahil. For Silage, this person named Bahil was a person who moved only for his own benefit. Silage obviously thought it was a deal to persuade one of his students to major in curses in exchange for receiving Andrea from Bahil's side. But that wasn't it. Bahil's condition was to give up on recruiting a student who had already decided to major in summoning. Just by declaring that he's giving up on recruiting Simon, Silage could have acquired an outstanding individual at the level of a direct disciple. He couldn't understand it at the time, so he avoided giving a direct answer, being dubious of Bahil. However, Bahil, you bastard. The corners of Silage's lips rose. So you were trying to take this genius for free, huh? At that moment, the lecture room door opened, and a male assistant teacher approached. Silage woke up from recollection and looked at him. Professor, I brought your coffee. Thank you. And you, go to my lab right now and prepare for research paper registration. Pardon? The assistant teacher blinked. In the midst of this busy schedule with the class being delayed, a research paper all of a sudden? Th then, what would the topic be? A new type of blood, said Silage while taking a sip of coffee. The assistant quickly figured it out. So you're going to research the blood of Simon Polantia? Yeah. We need to hurry before the other hemomancers and Kizan start to move. Let's call the new blood, well. After thinking for a moment, he chuckled and said. SM1 for now, I suppose. Read latest chapters at Wuxia World. Sight only. Understood. And relay this on to all the other assistant teachers. Silage's eyes lit up. From now on, we'll also participate in fighting over Simon Polantia. Chapter 58 It was the same in beginner dark magic, necromancy, and even their first hemomancy class. The Kizan professors came up with a class curriculum that seemed to be thinking a lot about the dual evaluation. Of course, curses, the last class of the day, was no exception. When I enter the class, the first thing I observe is the eyes of the students. Said Bahil, dressed in a sophisticated pure white suit as always, while setting his felt fedora down onto the table. Oh my! They're full of anguish today. It looks like you won't be able to concentrate in class. Shall I take a look at what you guys are thinking? Ah, it's the dual evaluation. The dual evaluation is the only thing on your mind right now. Small laughter came out with Bahil's humor. I also graduated from Kizan, so I know it well. The fact that you have to fight against other Kizan students must be unnerving. But don't worry. I'll show you the way. Bahil made his unique, trustworthy smile. With just this class, I'll teach you how to quickly and safely subdue your opponent. You just have to trust and follow me. The student's eyes sparkled. Needless to say, the name Bahil had some sort of great halo that 17-year-old boys and girls couldn't even look up to. I think the type of dark magic you'll use should have been established to some extent by now. 
let's divide today's class into two parts. Bahil looked around. Students who have clearly chosen the dark magic they'll use in the upcoming dual evaluation will need a curse specialized for support. I'll teach you the speedy heavy foot that can pressure the opponent quickly without burdening you. A clamor broke loose among the students. It was a spell that wasn't written in textbooks. Humans are creatures with a precarious sense of balance, standing up on their hind legs and walking with their back straight. Just falling over makes most of their actions impossible. Heavy foot restricts movement by exhausting only certain areas, including the opponent's feet. If the opponent receives it strongly or moves too hard, they'll fall over. Of course, the advantage is that it's a lot faster and lighter than exhaust. Bahil chuckled. And to the students who are looking through textbooks right now, it's only natural that you can't find it there no matter how hard you try. I refined it myself. Whoa. The following one is for the students who are curse aspirants or who'll mainly use curses in dual evaluation, as well as students who have not yet decided which dark magic to use. I'm going to teach these students a remake of the Paralyze curse. A remake of Paralyze. Yet again, it was a spell that wasn't found in textbooks. It's less effective than Paralyze, but it can be completed faster through refinements made for actual fights. I also arranged it so that it'd be effective with a combination of basic runes and formulas that first-year students can use right now. By stacking it up during battle, you'll be able to produce the original spell's effect. Two options were given to the students. Would they choose Heavy Foot, a weak but effective spell, or Remade Paralyze, a strong spell that allowed them to completely subdue their opponent? Now then. Let's split up. Bahil clapped his hands. Students who come to the left will learn Heavy Foot, and those who come to the right will learn Remade Paralyze. The students began to buzz around and split between the left and the right. At this time, Bahil's gaze was focused on only one person. Now, Simon Polantia. Madness was flashing in his eyes. A genius like you must wear clothes that fit you perfectly. Curses are the best way to utilize your jet black by 200%. Get rid of that old, outdated summoning. Not even a fool would use summoning as their main weapon in the dual evaluation. Don't you understand? Bahil was biting his lip with an unusually tense expression on his face. Simon, who was talking with Rick, Malin, and Camabras, shortly changed his course. Which way are you going? Of course, you'd go right. Simon came in with Malin on the left, and Rick and Camabras were on the right. Seeing Simon's choice, Bahil strongly bit his lip. He again chose curses as the sub rather than the main. Professor Bahil. At that moment, when Bahil was becoming furious, he felt someone's hand holding his shoulder. As he turned around with his eyes full of madness, the gray-eyed assistant teacher brought her finger to her lips. That face. You're making that face. Bahil's expression softened as if the anger was a lie and his usual soft smile covered his face. Oh my. I guess I got a little agitated. Thank you, Chehekel. It's all right. This is my job. Other than that, your command, please. Bahil straightened his tie. You could see the assistant teachers rummaging through the formula designs of heavy foot to prepare to teach. Send all the assistants to the right. I'll teach them heavy foot myself. What? But last week you said you'll be teaching Remade Paralyze. I changed my mind. This was a difficult situation. The assistant teachers had been expecting to teach the heavy foot, preparing the materials all night. Chehekel thought about persuading him, but he looked very firm. He would die before he changes his mind, huh? The assistant teachers would only obey the professor's orders. She bowed her head. All right, professor. Chihekel approached the assistant teachers preparing for class. They were setting up a mana projector and giving handouts to the students. Hold on. Gather up, assistant teachers. The assistant teachers gathered in wonder at the sudden assembly order. What's wrong? We need to start right now since it's a two-hour class. The professor has changed his mind. He's going to be teaching heavy foot. What? Bahil's assistants murmured in bewilderment. Hey, that's absurd, big sis. We prepared for heavy foot, but if he changes it like this on the day. Oh, this isn't right. 
Please persuade him, Sr. Chehekel folded her arms. You do know that he's not the person to listen to us trying to persuade him, right? Is it your first time seeing the professor being unpredictable? Stop whining and get ready. I'll try to do something with teaching paralyze. The assistant teachers laid down the materials, shoulders dropping, and moved on. While patting her juniors on the back to encourage them, Chehekel turned her gaze toward a boy sitting in his seat. The reason why professor is acting like that. Would it be because of him? While thinking that things would get tough from now on, for both her and Bahil, Chehekel turned her back. And just like that, including curses, all classes were finished for today. Rick went down to Rochest, and Malin and Camabras headed to the women's dormitory. Simon sat alone on an empty bench, staring blankly at the sky. A beautiful sunset was setting in the sky. What kind of thoughts are you so immersed in, boy? As he was blanking out, Peer talked to him. Simon looked up at the sky and said, Peer, does the commander have to major in summoning? Peer chuckled. Not really. If you want to choose combat magic, I can run the Legion myself. It's purely your choice whether the Legion goes down as a secondary and you focus on your natural power. The Legion will respect that will. After Simon stayed silent for a moment, Peer grinned. Why? Did you expect me to stop you? Simon made a guilty face. No, it's just that. Simon let out a huge sigh. Everyone says it. That summoning is weak. It's outdated. Other professors and students, and even Professor Aaron, who teaches summoning. So, are you going to stop summoning? Quitting summoning. Simon felt a strong repulsion welling up in his heart. Perhaps that feeling is how you really feel. Peer chuckled. In my opinion, boy, you like summoning. Although you're the type of person who likes to learn new things and feel a sense of accomplishment, your feelings for summoning are unique. Do you really need the Legion to find a reason to continue summoning? Simon couldn't deny a word. However, that mustn't be what you're agonizing about. What? Boy! Your thoughts and values are already established. It's not like you to think about whether to give up summoning just because of other people's comments. Something less than that. Something a little more trivial and insignificant than that. The corners of Pierre's lips went up high. Don't you just have the mentality of wanting to win this dual evaluation with summoning alone? Simon looked down at Pierre's clone with a shocked look. Then, he let out a small sigh and smiled. Whoa, I really can't fool you, Pierre. Kuhi! Don't you think it's stupid? I don't know when I'll be mature. There's a better way, but I keep wanting to win with summoning. Why do you think that is? Just, it pisses me off. Summoning is weak. It takes time. Support from other majors is required. Summoning alone can't win. It's all I've heard all day. From assistant teachers, Rick, professors, and even Toto, a summoning aspirant. Simon crossed his arms. It's not my major yet, but it pissed me off a little. That summoning is treated like that. But you've always chosen the most effective paths. I see. You agonized over it because those two notions collided. Yes. Simon stood up and brushed off his pants. So, what's the result of your agonizing? At least for now, I'm going to chase my dream. Simon grinned. Imagine. Peer. The people, everyone, were denying it. If he really won the dual evaluation with only summoning in front of such people. Don't you think it's gonna feel damn good? Kwa. Yeah. That's it. Peer laughed out loud. To be willing to walk a path that others don't. That act itself is special and valuable. Moreover, there's no reason for you not to when you have the ability and talent to pull it off. A blue flame swirled up from Pierce's clone. Remember, boy, you're none other than the commander of the Legion I chose. Don't hesitate to cross the line drawn by small fries with the strength of a shark. Do whatever you want. Yes, Pierre. A light-hearted smile finally formed on Simon's lips. Now, I have definitely made up my mind. Chapter 59 At the same time, in Bahil's lab. Shatter. Bam. Eyes red, 
but Heel was throwing anything he could get his hands on. Sculptures, trophies, research materials, everything hit the floor and shattered. Huff! Huff! In an instant, the surroundings became a mess. But Heel placed his hand against the wall and panted. The head assistant teacher, Chehekel, seemed to be used to this situation. She had her back against the wall, eyes closed. When the surroundings became quiet after a while, she opened her eyes. Are you done throwing your tantrum, Professor Bahil? Bahil strode over and leaned back on the sofa as if falling. He then reached out to his table and grabbed the tobacco pipe, lighting it up with dark magic and taking a sip of the smoke. Phew! Tobacco smoke stretched out. Seeing this, Chehekel frowned. Professor, smoking isn't allowed in do. Please, let it slide just this once, Chehekel. However, Bahil threw away even the tobacco pipe. As soon as it hit the wall, the pipe broke in two. Why? Why don't you understand me, Simon Polantia? He let out a long sigh as he hitchily swept his bangs up. He suddenly jumped up from his seat, unable to get over his anger. You're a genius. A genius among geniuses that only appears once in hundreds of years. Why are you wasting your insane talent on summoning? I can't understand it at all. Summoning is an old and outdated subject. Why don't you know that, no matter how successful you become with summoning, you'll become nothing but a second errand? Unable to bear the frustration, Bahil began to scratch his body as if his whole body was itching. Your maximum level would be Aaron. Think about how Kizan's special admission number one with legendary talent is now being treated at Kizan. His arms trembled like he was having convulsions, and then he flopped to the floor. Bahil's eyes glanced at the faded picture frame in the distance. There, the young faced him and Aaron, both wearing Kizan school uniforms, put their arms around each other's shoulders. It seemed like there was no hint of concern on the faces of the two boys. They were just smiling brightly. Perhaps the brightest in their life. But Bahil knew better than anyone. The fact that he's come too far to go back to that time. I can't stand it. Everyone's so pathetic. Professor. To see such brilliant talents being thrown into the abyss by themselves. I can't let this happen again. Only I can bring Simon back to life. Only I can cut that gemstone and turn it into the brightest gem in the world. Just be honest, Professor. Honest? That doesn't seem so bad. Bahil jumped up from the floor. I want to have him. A strange smile appeared on his lips. Veins bulged out of his fist. I insanely want him. Simon Polantia. I definitely want to make him mine. Here we go again. Chehekel looked like she'd given up. I'm ready to slash my soul for him. I'll use any means to unleash the best of his talents and create the second Nephthys. But he'll spread his arms. My dedication. My effort. My sincerity. My soul. And the only thing I want in return for risking my life is to bring him up into the realm of the gods. He smiled with a twisted face. Is for him to serve only me as a teacher. Sigh. When someone asks Simon how he got to the top, Simon will respond like this. It's all thanks to my teacher, Professor Bahil. Ah. I'm getting chills just by thinking about it. Chehekel, shaking her head as she watched Bahil trembling in madness, turned around. I'll leave now. Chehekel. Bahil approached her. I'm a person who needs to get what I want in order to be satisfied. Bahil strongly pulled her by the arm. Then, he lifted her chin as he held her in his bosom. Just like you. His eyes looked at a beautiful work of art. On the other hand, Chehekel, who was looking at Bahil with a pathetic look, kicked him in the leg with her shoes on. Bahil frowned and stepped back. This is sexual harassment at work, Professor Bahil. That sour personality from when you were still a student still hasn't changed. Said Bahil, fixing his collar. To think that the talent who'll succeed me is this stiff. Didn't you amend that it'll be Simon Polantia who'll succeed you? Oh, no way. The corners of Bahil's lips rose. Simon Polantia isn't just a talent who'll succeed me, but someone who'll one day surpass me. He'll stand shoulder to Nephthys. As an educator, I'm only expressing my reasonable desires. 
No, more like it'd be abnormal if an educator sees such talent and their blood doesn't boil. And you're going to keep saying that my desire to possess him is dirty? How could you describe trying to monopolize the right to teach a student other than dirty? My my. You're not trying to give a single word. But he'll put his hand in his pocket and tilt in his head. I got a good idea. What is it this time? Right now, Simon is quite content with his summoning. Even in Professor Jane's Cyclops battle, he was on a roll with summoning. That was the problem in the first place. But he'll's eyes glisten with madness once again. What Simon has to go through now is a bitter defeat. That way he can look back on himself and think about what the problem is, where he went wrong, and which way to choose. I guess you have a point. So, how are you going to make such a genius suffer a bitter defeat? Bahil's mouth was ripped into a demonic grin. Isn't that too easy? Classes went tightly day by day. Of course, it was because of the dual evaluation. Even Eric Ora, a professor for mechanics of jet black and a person who was quite thorough with theory, teaching even the origins of runes, moved right away to combat practice. Whether it was to reflect the needs of the students or not wanting to drop their future major aspirants, most of the professors taught mainly combat dark magic this week. Thanks to this, the students' dual evaluation repertoire had greatly diversified. Of course, that was true for all Kizen students. After taking the class this morning and finishing their early lunch, Simon was on his way to the next class with Rick. So the second and third class are both hemomancy. The hemomancy class, having been delayed due to the professor's circumstances, was assigned all week. Because of the fact that professors were active necromancers, there were many cases where the schedule became extreme. And at the same time, there isn't a single day of summoning this week. Simon let out a deep sigh. Rick shrugged his shoulders and replied. I heard that Professor Aaron went on a business trip. It bummed Simon out. As it was a dual evaluation season, Aaron would have taught him offensive magic, and it must have been a great reference for Simon. Even if he didn't, there must have been an opportunity to ask how you could use summoning to fight on an equal footing with other students. Ha! Huh. Rick, who was biting a sandwich as a dessert, stopped walking. Simon! Look over there! Hm. The brackets for dual evaluation are out. A large bulletin board could be seen in the direction Rick was pointing, and students were already swarming it. The two quickly ran toward it. My first opponent after coming to Kizen. Simon looked for his name with a pounding heart. I think I'll be fine as long as I dodge the few monsters. Lorraine Archbold, daughter of Nephthys. Serene Ein Dark, the successor of the Ivory Tower. Chattel Mare, the half-giant. It was a trio that must be avoided. Other than these people, Simon thought it was somehow manageable. Ah, found it. Stadium 2, Round 1, Match 12. Class A Simon Polantia vs. Class G Heron Cork. Who's Heron Cork? It was his first time hearing the name. Rick was giggling like it was the same for him. Legong Chopra? What a unique name. I wonder if they're from Shahid. Rick, you don't know yours either? Rick nodded and looked at Simon's opponent. Heron Cork from Class G. Want me to investigate a little? Like their specialty or majoring subject? Simon scratched the side of his head. I'll feel bad for you. Nah, Legong is also in Class G, so I'll just include them while investigating. It'd be nice if you also had information about your opponent, right? Yeah. I'd be grateful if you would do that. Simon moved his gaze back to the bulletin board again. Heron Cork. What kind of dark magic would they use to fight? Even if it was a dual evaluation, it didn't feel like they're just gonna throw punches. A stage where you could exchange dark magics with other students and clearly compare their achievements with each other. It'd be a lie if he said he didn't feel any pressure, but at the same time, his heart was pounding. I hope the class ends quickly. Hearing Simon talking to himself, Rick blinked. Ha! Huh. Why all of a sudden? You like taking classes, don't you? I have something to train personally in the evening. Rick chuckled. This bastard is about to do some stomping again. What training? Let's be honest. How many students do you think can respond to your combat magic and man-killing kick? 
Don't call it a man-killing kick. Plus, I'm not using combat magic as my main this time. What then? I'm gonna try fighting with summoning. Rick's eyes widened out of surprise, but he soon grinned. Would you like me to do the mail-in version, or the cami version? What's that? Just choose one. Mail-in? Rick folded his arms and turned his head away with a coy expression, and he said in a forced female voice, I clearly told you, all right? To fight with combat magic. Pfft. Simon laughed, spit flying out of his mouth. Rick, who was smiling proudly at his friend's satisfying reaction, suddenly fell down from a bag that flew at him. Just die. Malin was fuming, red-faced. Next to her was Camembert, covering her mouth and desperately holding back her laughter. Ah, what's wrong? It's the same if you heard, you ah. Die. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. As soon as today's class was over, Simon passed Kevin's stable route to Rochest. It's been a while since I came to Rochest at midnight. It felt a little strange to see the dark and quiet streets when they were so lively on the weekends. There was nothing good about being found out as a Kizen student, so he was wearing a robe, but there were many boys and girls who wore robes like Simon. First, the necromancer shop. Simon headed to the necromancer shop he had been to recently. Welcome. The last time he came, Rowan was working part-time, but this time, a young man with a monocle was sitting at the counter. So he's the shop owner. Simon heard a little about him from Rick. A necromancer who reached the second year in Kizen but had been pushed out by the competition and was currently running a shop in Rochest. Simon bowed his head politely. Hello, senior. The shop owner smiled in embarrassment. Ha ha. A senior? Ha. You don't have to be like that to me, dear Kizen student. Simon raised his head. Still, I heard that you made it to the second year. I'm nothing but a dropout. The current first-year Kizen students are much more valuable than an old student who dropped out. Still, he was smiling as though he was inwardly pleased. In fact, many of the people who set their feet and ran businesses in Rochest were from Kizen like him. Whether they couldn't forget their brilliant student days at Kizen or because they were nostalgic, they were people who still lived around Kizen despite no longer being able to enter it. Because of the existence of such people, the Kizen students, most of whom were high-ranking nobles, weren't able to make a fuss in Rochest. Anyway, what are you looking for, student? Simon answered the shop owner's question right away, eyes shining. I want to make a skeleton archer. Chapter 60 Oh! The shop owner folded his arms and smiled. Aren't you a freshman? A skeleton archer already? Yeah. I'm planning on giving it a try. There were different positions for skeletons. Skeleton archer, skeleton mage, skeleton rider, etc. The skeleton archer was simply a skeleton that used a bow as its main weapon. At first, Simon gave the island ratman skeleton a bow and made it try archery, but it was a total mess. It couldn't even hang an arrow properly, let alone pull the string. So when he looked through textbooks to find a solution, he found that there was a different kind of skeleton suitable for skeleton archers. Sapiro should be safe for a beginner to try out a skeleton archer. This way, please. Simon and the shop owner headed a little deeper in from the wide, central hall. Simon's eyes moved wildly. There was a pile of things that he couldn't understand how to use. He thought that it'd be quite interesting to come here and take a look if he got some time. The Sapiro's bones are over here. The shop owner got down on one knee and pulled out a box in a compartment under the shelf. As he blew off the dust, you could see silver letters on a black background. It had a very luxurious look. Shall I show you the inside too? Yes. Simon answered with a voice that was almost a scream. The shop owner opened the box with a smile, looking at his cute junior. Whoa! The inside of the box was covered with an antique red cloth and in the center was the skull of a Sapiros with two horns sticking out. In each space around it were vertebrae, arm bones, leg bones, and more, each stored by type. Vanilla makes the highest quality skeletons. Said the shop owner, getting the arm bone and flicking it with his finger. Did you hear that? It means that it's been properly refrigerated. 
for the ones that will be used as skeleton archers, the joint of the arm is important. Ah! Of course, the magic circle is also drawn on the skull. The shop owner carefully lifted the skull and showed its insides. You could see quite a complicated jet black magic circle. It's a magic circle that professional necromancers have carefully engraved inch by inch. The defect rate is remarkably low, and even if there's any defect, compensation will be given from the brand who made it. Bring it to the store, and I'll exchange it for a new one. He was saying things so fascinating that Simon should be ecstatic, but on the contrary, the smile on the corner of his mouth was shaking. I it must be really expensive then, huh? 30 gold per box. But as it's the vanilla brand that everyone knows, it's worth your money. 30 gold. Simon sighed inwardly. He knew that summoning cost a lot of money, but it was no joke after all. Of course, it didn't really matter to Simon as a commander, but 30 gold per unit was terribly expensive considering the short period of use for the skeleton. Isn't there anything a little bit cheaper? Of course there is. I'll show you. The shop owner got up and looked through the boxes. Then, he carefully pulled out a few boxes and placed them in front of Simon. Starting from the right, it's 27 gold, 24 gold, and 22 gold. Even Simon, who didn't know much about the undead yet, could see that the quality of the bones became poorer right to left. And there's also a 20 gold one made by an unknown necromancer. As he opened the box that had been roughly tied with string, you could see a huge mess of bones with a musty smell. After rummaging through the bones, he pulled out the skull and revealed its magic circle. The magic circle is still working properly, but it'd be hit and miss whether it's a defective product or not. I'll have to avoid that. Simon looked at the other boxes. What are you thinking about, boy? Th that startled me. Of course you should choose the most expensive vanilla brand. It's not like you can't use your skeleton if it breaks like other necromancers. Doesn't it all become the strength of the Legion? That's true, but... Simon looked at the boxes while pondering. What Pierce saying wasn't wrong either. If you're buying something, wouldn't it be better to choose a good quality one? I'll have three vanilla sets. Oh my, a big spender. Sure thing. The shop owner whistled and pulled out two more boxes with vanilla written in silver. Simon, who was watching him, suddenly became curious and asked. By the way, why is the brand name of the undead products called vanilla? The shop owner took out a bone and sniffed it. It's because the bones smell like vanilla. I'm just joking. The last name of the founder of the brand is vanilla. Now, let's proceed to the counter. Ah. Wait a minute, senior. Said Simon while gulping down his saliva. There's one more thing I'd like to purchase. Upon hearing what Simon wanted, the shop owner smiled. Oh, that's gonna be really expensive. Shall I guide you? Damn crazy. Hey, calm down. Do you plan to spend all the money you earn from the mission? Simon nodded his head, smiling, as he sweated profusely from his back. Yes, please. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Please come again. The shop owner bowed, and Simon left the necromancer shop with a light-hearted smile. As a bonus, he also received three bows for skeleton archers. TSK TSK. Are you that happy? Pierre grunted. You ended up buying that expensive thing. Ah ha ha. Sorry for spending recklessly without any consultation, Pierre. But. His heart was pounding. He'd placed the items he bought today into the subspace, but he wanted to open it up and touch them again. I thought it was essential for this dual evaluation. Well, if that's the commander's decision, I have nothing more to say. Since you already bought it, use it without regrets. Yes. He had to go back to Kizan before it was too late. He pressed on the hood and moved on. Perhaps because he stayed too long in the necromancer shop, it was already late at night, and there were no people on the roadside. When Simon was moving at a fast pace. Ah. Simon's face suddenly turned white when he saw the person walking from the other side. He immediately turned around and entered the alley between the buildings. H.M.? What? What's going on? It's someone I know. Simon stealthily peeked out. 
Although he was wearing a robe, the face and white suit that could be seen through it was a figure that any Kizan student could recognize. Professor Bahil? Why are you in Rochist? Is there a problem? Maybe he wanted to have a drink after work. Hmm. That was true. The private life of the professor after work wasn't something Simon should be concerned about. Ha! I'm finally here. Fortunately, he arrived at the dormitory without any incident. In the middle, he was in a dangerous situation where he could have been caught by the keeper scouting around Kizan, but he passed through without any problems. When he opened the door to room 409, his home sweet home, he was greeted with the usual view. Rick rolling in his bed while reading a magazine, and Kajan snoring with his blanket up to the top of his head. Oh, Simon, you're back. Rick stood up and said. Were you okay? Today was the day the keepers roam around. Simon shrugged. I almost ran into one, but I escaped safely. Ha ha. You got a lot of nerve, really. Even if you have an earnest image in class, you always deviate and escape to Rochist. Aren't you going out more often than me these days? Simon laughed it off, removed his uniform, and hung it in the closet. He changed into a light, short-sleeved outfit and prepared to leave the room. And where are you going now? To make some skeletons. All of a sudden at night. What are you planning to make anyway? Skeleton archers. With those words, Rick jumped out of bed like a spring. Whoa! Whoa! Are you already trying to use the skeleton archer? In this dual evaluation? Yeah. I don't know yet whether it'll work or not. It should be difficult for us to assemble now. What brand is it? Vanilla. Rick's eyes lit up while he grabbed Simon's shoulder. Ah, what are you doing? Hurry up and lead the way. Ha. The two left room 409 and headed to the lounge. They headed there because the dormitory self-study room was crowded with people, and they had to be quiet. This place would be perfect. There was no one else in the huge apart apart from two students talking to each other. Simon and Rick sat down. Hurry up. Bring them out. Simon opened the subspace and took out the box. The word vanilla was written in shiny silver letters on a black box. Kaya. Can I open it? Of course. When Rick opened the box, white bones appeared on the luxurious red cloth. Look at this charming color. The students who were chatting in the seat next to them seemed to be curious as well. What's this? A Sapiro's skeleton archer set. It's apparently from that vanilla brand. Whoa! This is vanilla? Everyone was looking at the box with eyes as if they were looking at the newest product. Simon looked at those students and chuckled. He liked the fact that they had common interests because it was a school of necromancers. But where's the assembly drawing? Hold on. Simon found a piece of paper enclosed below after rummaging through the box. He opened it, and everything was ready. Okay, I'll begin now. Go, go. Simon first inserted jet black into the summoning magic circle drawn on the skull. The colorless magic circle was dyed black, and the runes interlocked and rotated to build an ecosystem called the magic circle. Is it done? The magic circle was working, but there was no movement in the skull. Looking at the magic circle, some runes didn't activate properly yet. Look at this, Simon. Rick, who was examining the assembly drawing, said. See the four corners of the magic circle here? Apparently, you have to circling the jet black and put it in. What's circling? It must be the technique used to create magic circles and mechanics of jet black. We haven't even learned this yet. After all, from the beginning, it was a difficult skeleton for a freshman to make. Simon took out the mechanics of jet black textbook from the subspace. Circling. Circling. While halfway through the table of contents, he found the entry for circling. Simon opened that page. Huh. Isn't this? He wondered why it seemed familiar, but the content was similar to when he listened to Bahil about cooperation in the past. The cycle of jet black. Meditation. Black hole. It was almost like the cooperation Simon was using now. He thought that the tip Bahil gave was probably based on this thing called circling. 
I might be able to do this. Simon slowly raised his right arm and closed his eyes. Cycle, not transformation. A circulating image. Swaya. Jet black began to rise from Simon's palm. Jet black has a tendency to remember. Bahil's voice from his memory echoed in his ears. Just like the hands and feet of humans. If you repeat the same movements hundreds of thousands of times, the jet black tries to reproduce the acquired flow without realizing it. Isn't it amazing? That's why it's important to practice repeatedly and develop the right habits. Simon clenched his teeth. Just focus and contemplate. Make the jet black remember this flow and keep it this way. Swaya. The jet black had entered a stable state. Sweat dripped down from Simon's body. It worked. Now, even if he paid attention to a slightly different place and looked back, the jet black was spinning on its own. This was circling. Simon compressed the whirlpool like jet black into a small area and then inserted it directly into one of the four corners of the magic circle. Horror! A light came on in the corner. Like a mechanical device that was supplied with power, the runes that had stopped around them came to life and began to move. Hey, what the hell are you? Rick was left speechless. You're following it after going through a textbook once? Are you for real a genius or what?